uh, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to this literature seminar that it's a privilege and an honor for the Victoria Memorial Hall to organize in collaboration with the Consulate General of Italy in Kolkata. And this is a seminar on the worlds of poets Dante, Tagore and Danunzio, which is a very interesting combination uh, because Tagore and Danunzio are contemporaries. Uh, Dante preceded them by about six centuries but we will be talking across time and centuries about cultural interactions and the commonalities of, of culture and literature. So, um, and it's again a privilege and honor for us to have these distinguished speakers, uh, including Professor Shukanto Choudhury, uh, Professor Mario Prayer, uh, Professor Oishika Chakraborty, and several others. So uh, we had collaborated with the Consulate General of Italy before, but mostly on music. So this is the first time that we are breaking new ground in co-hosting a literature seminar. And we hope that this will be the first of many others on similar themes. So that's all I have to say for now. Uh, thank you very much for coming. We look forward to a fascinating few hours of conversations. And I would now request my dear friend, uh, the Honorable Consul General of Italy in Kolkata, Dr. Gianluca Rugaputti, to come and address the audience and, and, and get the proceedings going for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianto, for letting us uh, organize this uh, seminar in such a prestigious place uh, as you said it's the first times but we are happy to do things that were never done before so distinguished speakers and dear friends of Italy I am truly delighted to be here with you this evening this afternoon and clearly I'm the least qualified of all the speakers who will have the floor in the course of the day we have been working on this project for months uh, but uh, we had to postpone it due to COVID uh, I will not uh, uh, introduce uh, each uh, single speaker because I will leave it to Professor Mario Pryor, who came all the way from Rome, to uh, briefly introduce uh, our guest speakers. What I would really like to highlight is that uh, in the year that marks the 75th anniversary of diplomatic relation, bilateral relation between Italy and India, as you can see, there is the official logo here. We chose uh, literature as a medium to foster the friendship between our two countries and our two people. This is uh, a first step uh, in a series of initiatives uh, uh, which will put at the center of the public attention the works of these three great, great uh, maestri a publication of a book, uh, a new translation of an old classic, an art exhibition inspired by literature, a twinning between two house museums, a gallery dedicated to the journeys of Tagore in Italy. All of this uh, will only strengthen the relationship and the bilateral relations between these two countries that I like to define cultural superpowers, which are India and Italy. I'm glad to see such a number of people present here, plus those connected online. And since you're not here to listen to me, I would request uh, the organizer here to launch uh, the video that has been registered uh, in Italy. This has been a very nice tour of Pittoriali degli Italiani and uh, I find it very interesting and the kind of history that is associated with this uh, house museum and it is reminded that in Kolkata, in India, in Eastern India, we have a similar house museum of Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore, the first Nobel laureate from Asia, was born in 1861 and also reached his last in 1941 in the same house and therefore these two house museums can connect each other 
two civilizations, two cultures in Italy as well as in India. And as we are celebrating uh, the connection between Dante and India, we can also connect Italy with India through Tagore. And many of his writings, novels, poems, songs have been translated into Italian. And that can be a road through which India can connect with Italy in future. So this trip, this visit of mine to this place, this historic place has been quite important for building up the bridges between India and Italy. Sono molto contento della visita del professore al Vittoriale degli Italiani, primo passo di un incontro futuro fra D'Annunzio e Tagore, fra il Vittoriale degli Italiani e l'Università di Calcutta, patrocinato dal nostro console Gianluca Rugagotti, che ringrazio insieme a tutti gli amici dell'Università di Calcutta e agli studiosi italiani che contribuiranno a questo incontro di studio e di conoscenza. D'Annunzio amava Tagore, anche se non si sono mai incontrati. Abbiamo qua i libri di Tagore, comprati appena usciti, prima in francese e poi in italiano. E questo incontro culturale fra due paesi così distanti e fra due poeti anche per molti versi distanti, ma vicini perché la poesia non può che avvicinare, eh, sarà fruttuoso per una reciproca conoscenza, per l'amicizia fra i popoli e non solo fra Italia e India, fra Tagore ed Annunzio. Io eh, verrò a trovare gli amici di Calcutta in ottobre e, e sono molto felice di questo incontro. Grazie. I'm sure you have recognized one of the two guys as the vice chancellor of RBU. The other guy is the president of Il Vittoriale degli Italiani, which is the house museum of Gabriele D'Annunzio in Italy. It's one of the house museums, probably the most visited, with roughly three lakhs visitors every year. And this is the first step which will hopefully lead to a twinning, to an MOU, between these two centers of uh, art and culture. Now I would like to uh, start with the physical presentations with the keynote address by somebody that I don't need to introduce. So please, Professor Chukanto Chowdhury, come and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sede Rubagotti. Um, this is a, a privilege to be here, the privilege to be invited by you to speak. Also, a somewhat daunting privilege. You said that you were the least qualified of all the speakers today, but I remember you're telling me on an earlier occasion that when you were at school, you had to, I think, learn one canto of the Divina Commedia by heart every week. So how many people can any uh, speaker ever hope to face, ever have the you know, the daunting prospect of facing a man who has or had the whole of the Divina Commedia by heart. So, with some trepidation, I start my, my paper. Uh, I also owe an apology to everybody here, which is that um, the title of my paper has been rather uh, wrongly entered in the program. I have into, indeed contributed an article on uh, Ita the Italian Renaissance and the Bengal Renaissance to a volume which has been co-edited by Professor Mario Prayer and my colleague, uh, Professor Paravita Chakraborty. But today I will be talking on Dante, alone, Dante in Bengal. Okay. Now, truth compels, us to, compels me to start by accepting that Italian literature does not really have much of an independent presence in 19th century Bengal. There's a, quite a lot of discourse in 19th century Bengal, which I certainly would uh, think, uh, I think it can really be called the Bengal Renaissance, though I, that is, of course, a highly controversial point. Um, but there's a lot of uh, discussion there on the idea of the Renaissance and the model of the European Renaissance, but the Italian Renaissance does not play any particular part in the discussion, really, because 
from quite early in the 19th century, the English language had become virtually the sole conduit of European culture. And so material in English is overwhelmingly prioritized. The perspective looms, zooms out from English to generalized European, and the Italian is only a kind of subset of the latter, of the overall European perspective, which itself is a kind of adjunct to the Anglophile, Anglophone perspective. French and German were cultivated among small groups, most notably the Dotto family of Rambagan, to which Toru Dotto belonged. Um, Toru Dotto's A Sheaf Gleaned in French Fields translates a sonnet addressed to Dante and another addressed to Michelangelo, but the sonnets are written by a 19th century French poet, Auguste Barbier, and Barbier, in fact, quite inaccurately addresses uh, Dante as le vieux Ghibelin, the, the old Ghibelline, though in fact Dante was a absolutely not a Ghibelline in the, those two feuding political camps in Italy of his day, the Guelfi and the Ghibellini. Dante was a Guelfo, not a Ghibellino. Um, however, unlike, there is no comparable group uh, cultiv cultivating Italian the way the Dotto family cultivated French and German. A few Bengali scholars like the historians Rajendralal Mitro and Ram Das Shen, the musicologist Shorindra Mohan Tagur, uh, Tagur or Tagore, developed intensive Italian connections and find mention in the Dizionario Biografico degli Scrittori Contemporanei, you know, the dictionary of contemporary writers, which was edited by the Italian Orientalist Angelo de Gubernatis in 1879. But the actual writings of Rajendralal, of Ramdash, of Shorindra Mohun are exclusively in English and in Indian languages. And we cannot be sure how much, if any, Italian they knew. Michael Modushudan Dotto is a case sui generis, whom I will consider separately later on. The mediating role of English accounts for another interesting fact. Such attention as there is, is overwhelmingly focused on Dante rather than on any writer of the Renaissance proper, not even Petrarca, whose work, works might have yielded many affinities uh, to the Bengal Renaissance. I think this uh, focus on Dante, to the extent that there is any focus at all, it is on Dante. And um, this, I think, is largely owing to the greater availability of Dante translations in Bengali. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in, there were no translations in Bengali, um, in, in English. Henry Carey's blank verse English translation of Dante's Inferno appeared in 1805 and the entire Commedia in 1814. La Vita Nuova appeared in 1861 among Dante Gabriel Rossetti's renderings of the early Italian poets. As far as Petrarca is concerned, there was a full verse translation by many hands of Petrarca's sonnets, triumphs, and other poems, which appeared in Bone's Illustrated Library, that uh, standard series of books brought out uh, from England at the time, from London, in 1859, but it clearly did not have the same impact. Actually, if you come down even to the present day, Dante remains the only substantial Italian presence in Bengali literature, maybe with the partial exception of Pirandolo, and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, not even so much Dario Fo, Pirandolo, basically, in 20th century Bengali theatre. But the overall presence of Dante is undoubtedly greater. Um, but even so, the Bengali's Dante is generally an extension of the English literary universe. Even Hemchandra Bandopadhyay, whose Chayamoyi Kabbo marks the greatest ever impact of any Italian writer on a Bengali work, expresses his debt to Dante through a passage from the English poet Spencer on his title page. Chayamoyi Kabbo also links up with the only reference to Dante in Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, at least I trust it's the only reference, it's the only one I've been able to find, uh, again pointing to the controlling presence of English. In Bonkim's Lok Rahushu, there is a comic dialogue between a highly anglicized Bengali man who disdains all Bengali literature and his wife who can only read Bengali and does not know any English. Her, his, her husband to pick up a Bengali book that, she assures him, is translated from English. 
the book is Chayamoy Kabbo, which of course is not translated from English. It's an original composition by Hem Chantro. But anyway, um, the man, the husband, picks it up, sees a, you know, uh, an acknowledgement to, to a debt that the poet owes to uh, acknowledges to Dante on the in the preface, and says, and he whistles Dante by Jove, and then he, the husband, proves to know a few facts about Dante, for instance, that he was born in Firenze, in Florence, and the tussle about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, which he, uh, unlike the French poet, does get right. But nowhere is there a hint that Dante wrote in Italian. Now, of course, Bonkim himself knew it abundantly. There can be no question of that. It may be that Bonkim is satirizing the limited education of this overwinning Anglophile Brown Sahib. Some Dante, along with Italian and other European poets, featured in the new English-based program of higher education. David Lester Richardson, the celebrated teacher of Hindu college, edited a substantial anthology called Selections from the British Poets in 1840. But besides the British poets, there were also uh, quite uh, substantial translations from uh, continental European poets in various languages in an appendix. And among the Italian poets, there was, of course, Dante, then Petrarca, and later Italian poets. Interestingly, all the Dante, the Dante translations are not taken from Cary. Other sources, too. Now, but we may take this structure, you know, selections from the British poets, uh, a compilation overwhelmingly deported to English literature with the various continental languages represented in a kind of appendix. This is like the sort of overall structure or bent or bias, if you like, uh, the agenda of Western literary training for the educated Bengali of the time. It ensured Dante's background presence, but not much more. Any greater engagement with Dante or with any other Italian writer would have to be an entirely personal agenda. The outstanding instance of such an agenda, as I've noted already, is, of course, Michael Modusudan Dotto. With his idiosyncratic dedication to the entire literature of Western Europe, consolidated by his long stay there. In Michael's Mignat Botkabbo, Dante and Tasso are perceptible presences. Uh, in the Canto 8, Ostrom um, Shorgo of Mignat Botkabbo, uh, there is a description of hell, some of whose details uh, probably derive from Virgil's Latin epic, The Aeneid. Book six of the Aeneid, but most of the details are from Dante. Sorry, any problem? I see some people waving hands from there. Look, do you mind if I make a request, please? I, I think it becomes a bit of a distraction if, because of the photographs being taken, you know, the actual delivery of the speech or lecture or whatever it is, whatever I have to say, if that is, uh, I find myself distracted, I think. Uh, you know, I can request you really to desist. Uh, um, the overwhelming presence, as I said, in Dante's, in uh, Michael's account of the underworld is Dante. And the fiery inscription over the Hellgate is straight out of Canto Three of the Inferno. This is a, I'm translating Michael's lines, and all of you know those celebrated lines uh, the, the, from the inscribed to the top of Dante's Hellgate, and you can see how closely they correspond. This is Michael. The sinner goes this way to suffer eternal dole in the realm of sorrow. And then, however, there's an interesting uh, variation. Uh, Dante's famous line, of course, one of the most celebrated lines in uh, the, the Commedia, is Abandon all hope, lasciate only speranza all those who enter here. Instead of the expected word for hope, asha, uh, Michael uses the word spriha, attachment, longing, desire, call it what you will. I mean, somebody going through that gate can no longer hope or expect anything. But uh, uh, it's interesting that there should be this variation. But for the rest, very clearly the inspiration is Dante's hell gate. Dantesque, too, is the way that dead souls in Mignadbod express their amazement on finding Rama traversing the next world in living human shape. 
and without corresponding to precisely to anything in Dante, the pains of hell in Michael, in Meghnadbod, have the same lurid and repellent quality, far exceeding anything in Virgil. In fact, the Inferno leaves a clearer imprint on this sequence of Meghnadbod than the more commonly cited parallels elsewhere with Tasso's the Jerusalem Liberata, the Jerusalem Liberated, Jerusalem Freed. We might also question Michael's direct debt to Dante or Petrarca in his Chotuddashpudi Kobitabudi, a collection of the first sonnets composed in Bengali. Of course, Michael needed no Italian model for a verse form that had been acclimatized in English for centuries. In fact, he composed several sonnets in English early in his career, and also one in Bengali in 1860. But during his stay in Europe and his closer engagement with Italian and French poetry, it made him look at the form in a new light, largely through an intensive reading of Petrarca. But besides Petrarca, Dante was also clearly very much in his mind, and in 1865, he commemorated the sixth centenary of Dante's birth with a sonnet that he sent to King Vittorio Emanuele with Italian and French translations. The king's minister replied, gratified, I quote, that the profound and noble harmony of the Italian genius finds an echo on the shores of the Ganges. Okay. But apart from the sonnets to Ron Dante and Petrarca, none of Michael's other sonnets relates to Italy and very few to Europe. So all told, Michael's immersion in European literature and culture makes for a relatively substantial engagement with Italian literature, chiefly Dante, Petrarca, and Tasso, but leaves few clear footprints in elution and adaptation. It is more a matter of general absorption of the European literary tradition. Italy finds honorable place within it, and Dante within that in turn, but not as a dominant presence. Dante enters much more organically into the simpler but striking the original, not to say bizarre, construct of Himchandra Bhantapadha's Chayamoi Kabbu, published in 1880. In his earlier Koric ode, Indraloya Saraswati Puja, 1876, Himchandru links Dante with Milton, exhorting both poets to show not only hell, but all three realms, by which he doesn't mean, as Dante would have meant, hell, purgatorio, purgatory, and, and he paradise, but heaven, earth, and hell, Tripuvan in the usual uh, Indian sense. Yet also, M. Chandra asks both poets, Dante and Milton, to focus on Jama, Jama, Yama, the death god's fearsome abort, pointing to the, you know, the Miltonic Satanism, whereby the first books of Paradise Lost, focusing on hell, on pandemonium, on Satan, uh, received much more attention in the 19th century and later in England, in India, everywhere, than, in fact, the overall structure whose emphasis is much more on paradise, on the earthly paradise, and on heaven, the presence of God. And similarly, Dante also, you know, Dante is so often recollected uh, now and then uh, in terms of inferno. See, we talk about Dante's inferno more often than we talk about the, the divine comedy. And clearly, uh, Himchandra is also here recalling both Dante and Milton in terms of their treatment of the infernal regions, rather than the overall uh, view that both of them take. Now, the preface to Chayamoyi might indicate one reason why Himchandru thought of focusing on the inferno. Himchandru says in his preface that he could not adopt the Christian doctrine of purgatory and paradise. Hence, despite professing to draw substantially on Dante's thought and style, he can promise the reader only a slight trace, kinchit matro abhash, of Dante's work. But in fact, it's really more than a slight trace. There's a perceptible impact, but it's a highly transformed impact. Himchandru actually underplays the innovative design of his poem. His protagonist is a man overcome with grief at his daughter's death, carrying her body from place to place without bringing himself to cremate it. He finally arrives at a cremation ground with the descends to him a radiant goddess-like figure from the skies. After ensuring the daughter's last rites, she takes him with her, I mean this goddess-like figure, takes the man with her to visit the next world. 
the geography of this world is a curious reworking, one may say inversion of Dante. Hell is not located underground, but dispersed among the stars, each star accommodating a particular region or circle of hell. Yama, the god of death, in his aspect of the lord of virtuous justice, Dhanmaraj, sits in the remote, and in fact rather impressively described, heavens. He weighs the good and bad deeds of each soul in his balance, like Minos in Dante's uh, Inferno, and gives judgment. The souls are then ferried across the river Boitaroni the, to the gigantic figure of Kalpurush, Orion, who tosses them to the appropriate infernal star to undergo punishment. See, Hemchandru divests Dante's mythos of its Christian content, but scarcely aligns it with Hindu orthodoxy either. All souls in his design have committed some sins and must therefore suffer to some extent, even the saintly Yudhishthir, for the one lie he ever told. But having served out their punishment, the liberated souls, the Mukta Prani, they emerge in radiant heavenly forms, building up a new sky and stars, a new earth, a new sun and moon and universe. Notun akashtara, prithibi notun, nuton akashtara, prithibi nuton dhara, noborobi, noboshashi, nuton bhubon. These freed beings, these mukta prani, they can also descend to earth and guide and succor the living, dispelling the web of error, showing the straight path to all who have strayed. Guchate bhrantir jale, dakhate sharol pot, bipothi shakode. In other words, hell also assumes the function of purgatory, while the contours of paradise are left obscure. If Himchandra's poetic skill had matched his conception, Chayamoy would have rivaled Meghnadbod. It's really an extraordinary feat of the imagination, the whole structure, the overall concept. Unfortunately, the actual detailed poetic execution, the quality of the verse, uh, the poetic language, is maybe not on a par, certainly not on a par with my Michael and anywhere near it. But as it is, Chayamoy remains a compelling tour de force. Most of it is taken up with an account of hell in a creative assimilation of the inferno. The poet draws many details from Dante, but nearly always in combination with new elements in the same imaginative vein. The first sufferers that the visitors see have their faces turned backwards like the sorcerers, the magicians, in the 20th canto of Dante's Inferno. The bloody boiling slime in the fifth canto of the Inferno, uh, to, to, in which the sinners are immersed, or to which they speed in the vain hope of slaking their thirst. The, these damned souls in hell are so thirsty that try to slake their thirst even with the boiling slime. See? Um, see, this is what you find in the fifth canto of uh, Pancham Shargo of Hemchandra, of Chayamoyi. It reflects both Dante's phlegathon in the 12th canto of the Inferno and the boiling pitch of the 21st canto. The floating mass of diseased souls immediately after this in Hemchandru recalls the value of disease in Inferno. In the 7th canto of Hemchandru, souls are confined in trees and torn by vultures for the, secret, for the sin of secret lust, Guptokam closely recalls Dante's punishment for a different category of sinners in the wood of the suicides with his harpies who tear at these, uh, so these souls. But there are also centaurs shooting arrows at these souls in him genre, which come from elsewhere in Dante, from the 12th canto of the Inferno. Later, in the 7th canto of Chayamui, a winged python swallows and regurgitates sinners' bodies like the serpents in the 24th canto of the Inferno. There are other scattered fragments from Dante, fragments and echoes, usually overlaid by other components. The sinners are seldom named, but those that are form a curiously mixed lot. The perpetrators of falsehood, for instance, include Titus Oates, the 17th century English conspirator, who is thought to be behind the so-called popish plot, as well as Shokuni from the Mahabharata. Also, Mark Antony, orating over Caesar's corpse, clearly drawn from Shakespeare, was Hemchandru unconsciously prompted by the figure of Shakespeare's Brutus, 
leading him to substitute an ethical and literary universe radically different from Dante's, whose Brutus is one of the three foulest traitors in human history. In Dante's hell, Brutus is one of the three sort of worst sinners who are being crunched forever in the three faces of Satan himself. Not the least arresting feature of Chayamui is the heavenly figure leading to the protagonist. She finally reveals herself as his dead daughter, who has passed through the next world and has now returned to earth to guide her distracted father, as by her earlier account such liberated souls can do. So Hemchandru has ingeniously combined the roles of Virgil and Beatrice in the comedy. Virgil, the Latin poet, classical poet, pre-Christian Latin poet, who guides uh, Dante through hell and purgatory. And then Beatrice, the, 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 with whom Gandhi, with whom, uh, with whom Dante, for want of a better word, had been in love in her lifetime, and who then becomes a, a overwhelming a, a spiritual influence on his total life thereafter. Beatrice guides him through paradise. And Himchandru, as it were, combines these two figures of Virgil and Beatrice, a happy result of the freedom, of, of his freedom from the compulsions of Christian theology. Chayamoy is an unfairly neglected work, poetically undistinguished, but of awesome imaginative sweep. It marks the most substantial creative reception in Bengali of Italian literature of any period, not accepting, I think, the, uh, the, the reception of Pirandello in the 20th century. It also prompts speculation about hidden absorption elsewhere. For instance, could the evolving figure of Beatrice, from the Vita Nuova to the Commedia in Dante, be the governing presence in Biharila Chakraborty's poem, Sharada Mongol? This work, a collection of lyrics loosely gathered in cantos, appeared in full in December 1879, only some two weeks before Chayamui, but Biharilal had been working on it for the last nine or ten years, since 1870. Sharanda, of course, is Sharashuti, the goddess of art and learning. But as Biharilal explains in a letter to his friend Onad Bundurai, his Sharada is an intriguingly composite figure, object of the poet's yearning for friendship and love, as well as poetic inspiration, the last in three phrases. The poet's love, separation and reunion, Prem, Biroho or Milan, vis-à-vis Sharashuti, thus becomes a trope of his whole life story, romantic and personal, no less than philosophic and devotional. There is no allusion to Dante in the poem, nor to the best of my knowledge anywhere else in Biharilal, but the parallel with Beatrice is worth pondering. Biharilal is chiefly remembered as an influence on Rumindranath Tagore, Rumindranath Tagore, and it is with Rumindranath that I will end. In his writings, Rabindranath alludes occasionally to the European or specifically Italian Renaissance. In 1878, at the age of 17, he wrote two essays on Dante and Petrarca for the journal Bharati brought out by his family. These essays contain some memorable translations from both poets, but little else besides the resume of their life and works. In Dante's case, focusing much more on La Vita Nuova than on the Commedia, of which there is only a token account. In fact, the title of Rabindranath's essay, which translates as Beatrice, Dante, and his poetry, indicates the thrust of the young poet's approach. And the title of the other essay also translates as Petrarca and Laura. A subsequent piece on Goethe is Goethe and the women he loved. Goethe o So, you see, it is that, uh, well, Rabindranath was 17 when he wrote these essays, and it's the sort of romantic personal life of all three poets that seems to be the most conscious presence in his approach to all three. Dante is virtually the only Italian writer to feature at all in Rabindranath's other writings, chiefly with reference to La Vita Nuova. The essay on Goethe provides the key, contrasting Goethe's multiple amours with Dante's, and also Petrarca's, idealized passion. Let me uh, translate a passage from that essay on Goethe. Goethe, 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 Pronoini. Real events are the life of drama, the ideal world, the pleasure ground of poetry. Goethe could weave his love into drama 
where ordinary people found a reflection of their own hearts. But Dante could only express in poetry the wave of feeling, Bhav Taranga, rising in his heart from his interactions with Beatrice. Nobody else could have voiced this. In other words, it was the idealizing, unworldly sentiment of Dante's love that struck Robindranath, embodied in the Beatrice of La Vita Nuova rather than later in the Commedia. This accords with the general treatment of love in Robindranath's earlier poetry, culminating in the 1890 collection Manushi. But Dante's love persists as a trope to appear decades later in a very unexpected setting, which no doubt many of you were familiar with and can recall, the late political novel of 1934, Charodhai. Otin, the compromised and ultimately frustrated apostle of violent revolution, sees his career as a lapse from his ennobling love for his fellow combatant, Ela. And we can translate that passage from Char Uddhai. Suddenly one day, at a bend in the road, the goddess of fortune had appeared before him with an amazing gift of beauty, like a miracle. He had often felt that Dante and Beatrice had been born anew in the two of them. That historic inspiration had spoken to his soul. Like Dante, Othin had plunged into the maelstrom political revolution. So this shows that, at least by this stage, Dante was well aware of the subsequent course of uh, Dante. Uh, Robindranath was well aware of the subsequent course of Dante's life. Like Dante, Othin had plunged into the maelstrom of political revolution. But where was its truth, its valor, its glory? Before he knew, it had drawn him into the slime with irresistible speed. Romindanath accepts the totality of Dante's worldly experience, but co confines his love to an ideal and rarefied plane. Beatrice's death, placing her forever beyond his reach, is therefore essential to preserve the purity of that love, which Romindanath says in another reference to Dante and Beatrice, in yet another work, the travelogue Poschim Jatri Diary. I quote in translation. Beatrice stirred Dante's imagination at the point of location of an infinite love yearning, Biraho. His heart found its full moon in the distant sky of separation. It's quite a phrase, quite a metaphor. Such romanticizing of the ideally remote is the polar opposite of self-destructive revolutionary romanticism. Othin's Beatrice, Ella, is fatally close to him utterly surrendering by the end to his masterful power. She cannot rescue him from the abyss, but destroys herself instead. Yet Othin's end cannot compromise Dante's own synthesis of the worldly and ideal realms. In a 1901 essay on poets' biographies, Robindranath observes, the, the essay called Kobi Jiboni, Robindranath observes, I translate, Dante's poetry is entwined with his life. If we read the two together, both the life and the poetry acquire greater worth. And here, Rabindranath might not have had only La Vita Nuova in mind. After all, his, even his 1878 essay already shows his acquaintance, however cursory at that point, with the Commedia. We do not know how far he extends that acquaintance. Interestingly, in the five works where Rabindranath mentions Beatrice, he spells the name in Bengali to reflect the Italian pronunciation, not the English pronunciation Beatrice, but the Italian Beatrice. Beatrice is very generally, But in 1924, he told a Chinese audience how in his youth he had, this is from English speech, record, he had tried to approach Dante, unfortunately through a translation, and not really succeeded, and thenceforth felt it his pious duty to resist. Hence Dante remained, a closed book to him, his uh, Rabindranath's own words. Yet it seems it does open it sometimes, even to the last cantica of the Commedia, the of the Paradiso, which he ignores in 1878 essay. 62 years later, close to his death, during his penultimate illness, he sees a great vision. If you look at the 21st poem in Rog Shodjai, what is it he sees up, out there in the skies? A myriad stars and planets in skies beyond skies sustain a titanic harmony. Its rhythm is never broken, nor its music impeded, 
there is no lapse through distortion. There in the sky, unfolding its petals in layers, I see a great radiant rose. Okay. I think, um, let me quote these few Bengali lines. Lokkokoti groho tara akashe akashe, bohon koriya chale prokando shushama, nondonai bhangetar, shur nahi badhe, bikritina ghotaya shopon. Oi to akashe deki, store store papri melia, jotin moy birat golap. It might be the chance convergence of two imaginations of genius, yet we cannot but recall here the celestial rose in the last cantos of the Paradiso. Of course, without Dante's detailed enumeration of the heavenly host, he he sees uh, embedded there. Let's look in translation at Dante's lines too. I saw rising above the light all round in more than a thousand tears the eternal rose which expands and rises in ranks and exhales odors of praise to the sun that makes perpetual spring. No other Italian author of any period has left an impact on Rabindranath. He even notes in a work on the Bengali language, Bangla Shabda Tattu, in a particular piece out of that, called Bhashar Katha, he notes, I translate, Dante demonstrated by the power of his genius which provincial tongue would become the Italian language everywhere for all time. Actually, probably the greater influence here was not Dante, but Petrarca, who in the 16th century, it was people like Pietro Bembo, who uh, as it were, laid the basis for standard modern Italian by using um, Petrarca's Tuscan language more than any other source. Uh, but uh, certainly Dante featured. The English civilian John Beams, in an English essay which survives only the Bengali translation in Bongo Darshan, proposed a Bengali academy on the lines of the Academia del Crusca. He there states more correctly that it was primarily Petrarca's Tuscan that served that purpose. But the reference shows how Rabindranath is aware of the Italian Renaissance, if largely within the greater European movement. In this, he follows his predecessors and contemporaries of the long Bengal Renaissance. In Rabindranath, the Bengal Renaissance attains closure by generating its historiographic paradigm from within himself, within itself, as conceived by its latest and most outstanding exponent. The Italian Renaissance, and what we would call the pre-Naissance, as epitomized by Dante, find what place they can within this indigenous paradigm of a Renaissance. It is not simply a matter of illusions, parallels, or even organic transmission. Essentially, 19th century Bengal discovers itself and weaves Italy and Europe into that narrative. Most notably, it also incorporates the chief poet of Christendom. So that is quite a notable record of reception. To seek more would be going beyond the evidence, it would be extravagant, but to settle for less would be an impoverishment. Thank you. Dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have the honor of being next to Professor Shukanto, Shukanto Choudhury and his keynote address that has uh, given, given us a very detailed, very learned and wide view, wide uh, uh, awareness of the rich treasure that just one poet, Dante, could deliver to his uh, counterparts in 19th century Bengal and, and after. And this has uh, set the stage for us to continue our deliberations and uh, ins inspect some other areas of this interesting topic that is uh, the relationship uh, between Italy and Bengal. But before I start, please let me uh, give you a broad overview of uh, what is going to follow. 
uh, in this uh, second section uh, where we have the, uh, the papers by various uh, scholars. So first of all, I would like to, uh, of course, thank uh, Dr. Janto Shengupto, who is the director of uh, the Victoria Memorial Hall for his hospitality, very kind hospitality that has made this uh, event possible. And uh, uh, my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Gianluca Rubagotti, uh, who, <laughs> who has organized this, uh, this event, who has, uh, he is actually the moving spirit behind all this. And we had a lot, a lot of uh, uh, gratitude for all the things that he has done. I would also like to thank other co-organizers of this event, uh, Professor Shobashachi uh, Boshurai Choudhury, the Vice Chancellor of Rubinzo Barati University. I would like to thank Dr. Giordano Bruno Guerri, the president of the of foundation, the D'Annunzio Foundation, the Vittoriale degli Italiani. And I would also like to thank uh, my own department of Oriental Studies of Sapienza University uh, for uh, their support in, uh, in my role as a co-organizer of, uh, of this conference. Uh, after my speech, there, uh, there will be other papers. Some of the papers will uh, deliver um, uh, from a remote uh, station. Not all the speakers were able to attend because of, for various reasons. We all know that we are, are going through a difficult period. So we will have Professor Shujata Mukherjee the, from the Department of History of Robindra Bharati University uh, with a video talking about man and nature uh, in Tagore. Then uh, Dr. Uh, Giordano Bruno Guerri will also talk about uh, uh, the relationship between D'Annunzio and India. Uh, this is also going to be a video. And then we will have a, a coffee break for of about uh, half an hour. After uh, the coffee break, we will have uh, Professor Pietro Gibellini of uh, Cafosca University of Venice who will talk about uh, the relationship between Dante and D'Annunzio. Then Professor Oshika Chokroborty of the School of Women's Studies, Jadopur University, will talk about uh, dance, dance unbound nationalism, transnationalism, and the dance over of Tagore. And finally, there will be um, uh, another video presentation by Luisa Pryor. Uh, she is a pianist and a teacher of uh, chamber music at the Conservatory of Music Giuseppe Verdi in Milan. And she will talk about uh, D'Annunzio and Tagore, a new inspiration in 20th century Italian music. So this will be the concluding paper and it will also contain some musical example, examples uh, of this new inspiration in the um, after the, this uh, section, we will have the um, presentation of a book, the latest uh, chapter of a project that Jadopu University is carrying on, uh, translating Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Uh, and this will be uh, introduced by Professor Shujan Mukherjee. And after that, we will have a session of questions and answers and discussions. So I am now coming to my paper, Italy and Bengal relationship at, across borders. Uh, my purpose is to only just to give a very a bird's eye view of this relationship over the last uh, roughly about two centuries and to uh, trace the most important elements uh, in the historical context all around this uh, cultural uh, relationship that may explain certain things uh, that happened 
uh, in this period, and particularly in the period that uh, uh, I will concentrate on, that is the uh, early 20th century. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we are talking about uh, three poets uh, today, Dante Alighieri, Rabindranath Tagore, and Gabriele D'Annunzio. As you can see, they belong to different periods, as uh, Professor Shukato Chodori has said. Um, so uh, Tagore and D'Annunzio were almost contemporary. We, we have no uh, information about uh, Tagore and D'Annunzio actually meeting in person. Uh, we know that D'Annunzio read many books uh, uh, by Tagore. Uh, uh, we don't have any information so far about uh, Tagore's view of D'Annunzio, whether he knew D'Annunzio or not. But certainly there is a middle ground between them, that is Dante Alighieri. Next, please. So these two poets somehow uh, enter a dialogue through Dante. So uh, th this was uh, one place, one world of poets where they could meet. So both draw, drew inspiration from his works. Uh, but as I was saying, they also lived in, in the same period and uh, so they uh, uh, represent a certain attitude of writers, intellectuals, or prominent figures uh, that are facing the problems of their times. And there we can find many similarities. This is a project that, that is starting actually now to uh, inspect the similarities, the points of contact between Tagore and Danunzio. And uh, we have seen that there, this is a uh, an area that has a huge potential. And uh, so we are just moving the first steps in this, uh, in this area. Next, please. In this um, newspaper cutting, that is from the time of uh, Tagore's third and uh, last visit to Italy in, in June 1926, so in this newspaper, we find Tagore and Denuncio side by side. So this is an instance where we find that they are just meeting in an on a newspaper page, They're talking about different things, the, these articles. But this, this, what does it mean? It means that they lived in the same time. And for contemporaries, both were presents. You know, uh, Tagore meant something to the Italian public and to the Indian public. And the Nuncio also was there. So how do we place these two important figures in the context of uh, that time, please? Um, I'm not going uh, too much uh, in, in details into the uh, relationship between the Nuncio and India, because th this is the topic of another paper. Uh, of course, we have the centrality of dissenters and innovators. That is uh, certainly a, a common feature that we find both in the Nuncio and in, in Tagore. And both of them have created institutions that up to the present work for the preservation of their legacies. So uh, Vittoriae de Italiani near Lago di Garda in North Italy, and then uh, in Kolkata, Giorashako Takurbari, and Bishop Bharati, of course. So um, even from an architectural point of view, <laughs> there are some uh, elements that deserve uh, uh, further study. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, if we look at the last two centuries of the Bengal Italy transcultural encounter, which is the topics of a book that uh, I'm quite uh, with uh, Professor uh, Paramita Chakraborty uh, of Jadavpur University, we find uh, a long and continuous 
story of encounters, of initiatives, of exchanges of various kinds and over time also changing drastic, drast dramatically from the beginning of the 19th century, Ramon Roy, to later period. I have just selected at random some things here, some uh, figures who uh, were prominent in this uh, story. So Ramon Roy, uh, Shurendra Dashgupta, uh, Federico Pelletti, who has a, a, rest, a famous restaurant in Kolkata, and all, he was also a photographer. Kalida Schnag, uh, essayist and scholar. Uh, Shurendra Dashgupta, uh, philosopher. Giuseppe Tucci, Italian in, Indologist. Maria Montessori, you know, wherever you go in Kolkata, you find Montessori schools. Then uh, Shonali Dashgupta and uh, Roberto Rossellini. Uh, we know of, of their uh, uh, meeting, their collaboration, the Love Study, which was uh, all the first pages of newspapers at the time. And then two examples of very recent uh, translations. Uh, Italian, an Italian writer, Italo Calvino, translated into Bengali, and Jumpa Lahiri, who is now writing in Italian. No? So you see there are so many different uh, thing that, things that are happening, have been happening for the last two centuries. So we, are just, we have just started telling this very complex and interesting story. So I will concentrate now on the period where, when Tagore came to Italy, uh, which, uh, which is the moment when Tagore, uh, as a mature writer, mature uh, cultural figure, came to the land of the Nunzio. So what happened at that time? Uh, so if we want to trace the significance of Tagore's visits to Italy in the specific circumstances of the mid-1920s, of course, we have to refer to certain things that have been covered by studies on this subject. Uh, this, uh, we have so far uh, uh, many biographical uh, studies uh, or Mm, also studies of particular, uh, in particular cultural perspectives that have highlighted the meeting between uh, Mussolini and Tagore and the controversy that um, bro broke out at that time because of Tagore's involvement in uh, fascist propaganda and how he was a bit reluctant uh, to uh, express uh, what he called the refusal of support after being the guest of the Italian government in 1926. So this, this was a controversy that is well known, has been documented. Uh, but there, is, there are some other uh, aspects that uh, are perhaps worth uh, being looking into. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, the general context, the cultural context of that was around this uh, uh, this event in uh, 1925, 1926. Uh, so, what was the role of India in the Western culture, uh, and uh, the, how was India? viewed in the culture of the time. What, what was the importance of India? Because Tagore was uh, welcomed as a, almost as a family friend in Italy. So everybody knew Tagore, but how was this actually possible? So since the late 19th century onwards, uh, we have, uh, of course, we have the rise of Indian nationalism. And uh, at the same time, India had acquired an additional dimension within Western culture and uh, society. 
uh, what was the historical context uh, of this uh, period? In 1913, Tagore uh, received the Nobel Prize and he, he, he became immediately extremely popular in Italy. Everybody wanted to know who this Tagore was and what was he writing about. And immediately you, f you find translations on journals or of uh, selected poems by uh, Tagore. But this was the time when in the West uh, certain movements were rising to challenge the so-called establishment. Movements for a new world order and social emanci emancipation. This was also the period, uh, the period of a decline of both positivism and Christianity as valid answers to the human aspiration to a free and meaningful existence. Positivism have had neutralized many of the certainties that religion was given. And, but at the same time, positivism was not enough. It was criticized and it itself declined because it lacked something. It did not uh, uh, fi find answers for certain aspirations of uh, the human soul to the a fuller meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? So, uh, in this situation where uh, certain cultural uh, values uh, were declining, but there was a lack of uh, uh, new values who could replace them. So there were many movements, also cultural movements, that were trying to recover uh, another kind of spirituality. Uh, and this was through religions, but other religions, not Christianity, including Indian religions, Buddhism especially. And uh, also in the arts, we find that from the end of the, uh, the 19th century, and especially the early 20th century, a movement in the arts to spiritualize the art. But what is this spiritualization about? It is about freeing the artist, freeing the human expression, the human creativity, beyond all uh, canons, beyond all uh, forms, pre-imposed forms and uh, paradigms. So these are examples, uh, Kandinsky's uh, essay on the, the spiritual in art, and uh, Alexander Skriabin, a Russian uh, composer who was a theosophist. And so he thought that uh, music and theosophy could bring uh, a regeneration, uh, a new renaissance, a regeneration of the entire world. Next, please. Uh, so India's relevance in this context was uh, very prominent. We find all these movements that somehow involved India, Indian culture, Indian religion, Indian philosophy, Indian spirituality, theosophy, traditionalism, uh, philosophy of idealism, and Freemasonry. So these are what we can call, uh, define as right-wing movements. That is, movements that are, uh, propose an elite, an enlightened elite through all these uh, currents, who could govern the world, rule the world to a, a better uh, level, to something better, to something higher for humanity. So this is uh, an example of an Italian traditionalist, uh, Julius Evola, who wrote about yoga, the power of yoga to create a hero, a perfect man, so uh, regeneration of mankind. So you find a lot of India here. You find a lot of India also in left-wing movements, uh, movements for socialism, women's emancipation, labor. So. 
Here you, uh, uh, of course, there were many uh, Indian leaders uh, who were participating in this uh, uh, cosmopolitan uh, platforms uh, in uh, and defending the, the rights, defending the living conditions of the lower classes and of people who had only uh, who had been marginalized so, uh, so far, and there was the call for a new order. And you find many Indian leaders in this platform as well. Also, you find India in anti-imperialist movements, like the, this is a, a, a sitting of the League Against Imperialism. Of course, the case of India was uh, extremely prominent. India was uh, organizing itself uh, in, a, in the struggle for independence, and that was an example for many movements of this kind uh, over the world. So all these uh, trends become suddenly become uh, visible. The next in Italy's approach to Tagore in, di in this period, in, uh, from the after the Nobel Prize to the uh, outbreak of the uh, Second World War. So they were activated. And you, if, if you go through the uh, newspaper reports of uh, Tagore's visit day by day, you find that all uh, representatives of this left wing, right wing, anti-imperialist women's societies, they all ran to Tagore and wanted to meet him. Uh, so he represented, he was an embodiment, so to say, of all that these different kind of movements uh, wanted to achieve. And he represented this idea of regeneration, but this was uh, very closely uh, connected to a perception of India as a land of ancient spirituality. So why was Tagore popular in, in Italy? Of course, his books, first of all. Uh, Tagore as a writer. Uh, Tagore uh, brought to the in Italian readership a new set of meaningful images, reco reconciling the quest for the spiritual with the common man's daily experience in a way that nobody had done before. And such was his success that the publisher Caraba from uh, Lanciano, who had uh, uh, the good idea of getting the copyright from Macmillan, so these are all translations from English. Uh, he, th this publisher started uh, bringing out a huge number of books, uh, almost one, sometimes two, new books every year. So in the period 1914 to 26, we have 15 new titles, so more than one per year. And in the uh, subsequent period, another 10 new titles. All the entire range of Tagore's works were uh, popularized in Italy. And it can be said that almost in every house there were at least one or two books by Tagore. Everybody had read Tagore, including Danunzi, of course. So this was a reason why Tagore was famous. So, uh, next, please. But he was also considered as the voice of something new that was happening in India. Because what he wrote, yes, uh, it showed that he was uh, a representative of Indian ancient tradition, but there was something else. Many said that this is not traditional India. This is something very modern. This is something that speaks to every one of us. So he was also uh, appreciated for that. He was seen as an upholder of peace and mutual understanding between countries and civilizations in post-war Europe. The war was a disastrous experience. It brought destruction and death. And Tagore could bring some um, uh, relief to the souls of many readers. 
uh, with his uh, with his work, and he was seen as a great master of spirituality. The spiritualist movements in Italy looked up to him as a great master, and even today, Tagore is considered as one of the great uh, theosophists of India, but he was never a theosophist. In fact, he was uh, he disliked theosophy, but it was somehow confusingly you know, put together and uh, placed on that level, the level that this is uh, somebody who can teach us some, something for our, for our soul. Uh, so Altra is a journal of Italian spiritualism, and you find uh, so, uh, a lot of appreciation of Tagore as the, the grand, grand master. And uh, as I've said, he was a reference person uh, for anti-establishment forces, both li left-wing and right-wing. And this explains also why Mussolini's regime had an interest in Tagore. Because even fascism was anti-establishment. If you take the uh, European context, uh, so that world order, Italy wanted to enter and disrupt this order. So even right-wing forces thought that Tagore is absolutely essential for their own purposes. Next, please. Tagore was seen as a defender of women's role. His play, uh, Citra, was staged in Rome at Teatro Argentina during his uh, visit. Uh, so there was a keen uh, awareness that Tagore had written something for women. And he was invited by women's societies in Italy to deliver a speech when he went to Italy. He was an educationist, and he was interested in an, an exchange with Italian universities. Professor Formichi was the mediator. And he also was proposing uh, some innovation in the education that is relevant in even today in Italy. So uh, educationists in Italy still go back to Tagore and study his uh, model of school. Of course, he was appreciated as a creative mind, both as a writer and as a musician. In Italy, everybody knew that Tagore was a singer, or had been a singer, or, and was a musician. And they uh, took him to the opera and to uh, hear from him, what do you think of our music? So to bring about uh, some interaction, also at the musical level. And also there is the question of, uh, the Bengali language. Very few people knew Bengali in Italy at that time, which is unfortunately uh, true today as well. But there was, again, there was a keen interest in Tagore as a writer in Bengali, and also about Bengal as a land. So we find in the newspapers that people went up to him to ask, do you find similarities between your Bengal and Italy? Do you think that our city is similar to your Bengal? So there was a, <coughs> so, uh, some kind of interest, uh, wish to, a desire to know more about Bengal, specifically Bengal. So the Bengali identity of Tagore was not entirely lost, though he was most, mostly seen as an Indian, but his Bengali identity was, was not lost. Yeah, completely. Next, please. Now I'm concluding my presentation with this question uh, about the spiritual, you know, the idea of spiritual, that is a notion created by Orientalism and attached to the Oriental civilizations as an instrument of conquest, of control, of, poly of in imposing European power over other continents. But if we take spirit, this spiritual that in the West itself now was helping movements for a new world order, can we say that the spiritual of Orientalism 
made Orientalism self-defeating. It was a creation, a production of Orientalism, but it contained the seeds that determined the implosion of Orientalism itself and of European uh, imperialism. The next, please. At the same time, end of the 19th century, early 20th century, we know that there is you know, this discourse of uh, uh, contrast between uh, the spiritual India and the materialistic West, which became a source of inspiration for Indian patriots to affir reaffirm Indian cultural identity. So they took this stereotype, the, this colonial stereotype of the spiritual, became actually a weapon for the nationalist movement. So, and the idea of India's mission in the world, propagated by, for example, by uh, Shami Bibekanondo, and later uh, leaders, nationalist leaders like uh, Shubhash Bosch, who uh, had a very strong uh, interest for the spirituality as a support of his political engagement. Even when he was a Netaji, even on the, in the war theaters uh, in uh, East, uh, East Southeast Asia, he was practicing yoga. And so he, he was very keen on keeping in touch with this kind of tradition. So this all goes to show that Europe and India established a partnership. At the same time, they used the same notions to bring about something new. And this new thing is freedom. The freedom, social freedom, political freedom, but also freedom of the mind and freedom of the soul. And this story is continuing till today. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I would first like to thank the organizers of this conference, and especially my friends Shongjukta and Mario, for inviting me here and giving me this wonderful opportunity to share some of my views on Tagore's perceptions about relationship between man and nature. In a number of writings, Tagore expressed his passionate love for nature. Once he wrote to his friend C. F. Andrew Andrews, "I had such an exceeding love for nature." that I cannot think in what way to describe it to you. But she was a kind of loving companion, always with me, and always revealing to me some fresh <coughs> beauty. In Vonavani, or The Message of the Forest, uh, which contains hymns to trees, creepers, and flowers, Tagore calls the tree, my dumb friends who are in love with light, and stretch their fingers to the sky. Thus speak the world's oldest language and send an echo to my soul's deepest core. Tagore's conception of nature is many-sided and romantic. His imagination transfigures the common objects of nature and glorifies them as the manifestation of eternity. He etherealizes, beautifies and spiritualizes nature. In Gitanjali, in a number of poems, devotional poetry mingles with the poetry of Nature, poetry in which the poet explores the relationship of God and nature and of nature and human soul. The song Ekti Namushkare Prabhu Ekti Namushkare is a superb example of Tagore's use of nature imagery for soul's yearning for complete identification with the Supreme. In one salutation to thee, my God, let all my senses spread out and touch this world at thy feet. Like a rain cloud of July hung low with its burden of unshed showers, let all my mind bend down at thy door in one salutation to thee. Like a flock of homesick cranes flying night and day back to their mountain nests, let all my life take its voyage to its eternal home in one salutation to thee. According to Tagore, man is emancipated 
from his narrow self-centered existence through an aesthetic perception of unity with the world of nature and its beauty. Ezra Pound said in his review of Gitanjali, he is at one with nature and finds no contradictions, and this is in sharp contrast with the Western mood. When one of the creative, most creative phases of his life was spent by the river of the, uh, by the bank of the mighty river Padma, now in Bangladesh. The poetry Shonattori and prose Chinnapatra, which he wrote during his sojourn here, shows how keenly he observes nature and with what delicacy he depicts the seasons of river Rhine Bengal. The wide skies and open spaces of Shantiniketan, where over a span of 40 years, he experimented with education and gave shape to his dreams, inspired him to compose incredibly beautiful songs. Tagore wrote approximately 2,232 songs. In many of these poignant and evocative songs, the ever-changing moods of different seasons are captured beautifully. Ever since Tagore's time, it has been a tradition at Shantiniketan to welcome each season with Rabindra Shangit and dances. One of the most important events would be the Bengali New Year celebration. Boishak and Joishto, the first two months of the Bengali New Year, are known for hot summer days and also is the time when thunder and violent storms, known as Kal Boishakhi, strikes Bengal. Tagore welcomes hot summer days in his song, Esho He Boishak, Esho Esho. I call on you, O Boishak, Dust away all that is <coughs> dying with your ascetic breath. Let go old memories. Let go forgotten melodies. Let mists of the eye thin far away into dissolution. Let weariness be erased, infirmity cease. Bathed in fire, may the earth gain purity. Bring forth and uh, sound your conch of annihilation. Let the foggy mists be driven far away. Monsoon was perhaps the poet's most favorite season. Barsha Mungul was first celebrated in Shantiniketan by Shomindranath, poet's youngest son, in 1908. Robindranath's familiarity with the Bengal monsoon intensified during his trips to the family estate at Shilaidaho. In one of the letters that he wrote from there, he noted, the clouds gather over the sky, the storm mats the rains, Lightning and thunder wouldn't stop. I am writing in candlelight with the window partially open. But within me there is great joy in the force of the storm, in the shadow of the clouds, in the sound of the thunder. A deep wave rises in my heart. I feel like doing something, at least to think of an impossible imaginary event. The songs like Esho Shamulo Shundaro, which welcomes monsoon, Nilo Anjano Ghano Punjo Chayai, Describe the serenity and joyous emotions evoked by the monsoon. The imagery that these songs sketch brings out the fervor of the season and depicts the dazzling beauty of monsoon. Tunes blend well with the images and emotions. Indian classical ragas like Miyaki Mallar, Megh Mallar and Desh have been harmonized with the wordings. Traditional folk tunes add color to the monsoonal songs. The famous song, Aji Jharo Jharo Mukharo Badaro Dine, which can be translated like, Today in drizzling rains and rumblings of a cloudy day, No, not I, no, not why, why on nothing does the mind stay. This blends a sense of melancholy with a profound sense of restlessness. Um, <clears throat> Now, next, Sharodut Shah was introduced to celebrate autumn. His song, Bishu Bina Rabe Bishu Jano Mohiche, describes the spirit of autumn as Sharod Lakshmi, the white attired goddess, whose glory is revealed through the pleasant rain bathed landscape and whose smile is reflected in the clear blue sky and in the full moon nights. The season is also visualized sometimes as an abstract and pristine feminine beauty who appears through the fleeting shadows of clouds that resemble the fluttering of a dewy veil in the golden sunbeams that serve as Sharad Lakshmi's ringing bangles. 
Winter wears a cheerful and festive look in Tagore's writings. He does not find the winter wind uh, mercilessly cold. On the contrary, the wintry breeze in Bengal makes the branches of the Amloki tree dance in delight. Shitir Hawai Laglo Nachon Laglo Nachon Amloki Rui Dale Dale. Post the first month of the winter is the month of harvesting too. The fields are swaying with the golden grains. He writes, Posh to their duck dhe ai re chole ai ai ai. Posh has heralded a call for you all of you. Come one and come all. This call is also for participating in a festival of plentitude. Dala jetar bhore chhe aaj paka fashole. Your container is full today with ripe harvest. The Bengali spring found its rightful place in a riot of colors in Rabindranath's writings. He writes cheerfully of the gifts that people make as Falgun walks in with spring in its hands. Falgun hawai hawai kore choje dan, amar apun hara pran, amar badhun chera pran. I have contributed my selfless soul, my soul bereft of all ties to the Falgun breeze. In other songs and poems, the poet also portrayed the joys and delights of the festival of spring, which he always found to be a season of everlasting hope. Boshuntu Utshap observed on the full moon night of the spring season coinciding with Holi would be the most spectacular and aesthetic of all festivals. It was in these public spaces of festivals or Utshap that the familiarity with nature was rejuvenated. The date to Prakriti was acknowledged and in simple aesthetic action a sense of beauty was deepened. Long before many influential social psychologists would theorize about the need for reviving collective art and ritual on a secular and non-sectarian basis, Rabindranath was already putting this into practice. He was exploring the possibility of creating secular festivals and celebration of collective art in an otherwise socially and culturally fractured society. He conceived the Utshava festival as a celebration of diversity that would transcend narrow denominational boundaries of caste, creed and class and hence introduce the celebration of seasons through songs and dances in Shantini Ketan that excluded none. Nature becomes the supreme deity, transcending the boundaries between narrow self and what lies beyond. And perhaps here, the relationship which man and the ties which man and the bondings which man find with nature really sustains the civilization. Thank you very much. I would request you to remain for one last video, which is less than 10 minutes, and then we can break for some tea. Thank you. Buongiorno, eh, ringrazio il console e amico Gianluca Rubagotti che ha fortemente voluto e organizzato questo incontro e quelli che seguiranno. Ringrazio la Rabindra Bharat University di Calcutta, il professor Mario Pryer e tutti i professionisti e gli amici di Calcutta. Eh, questo incontro rafforzerà l'amicizia fra Tagore e D'Annunzio, un'amicizia ideale perché non si sono mai incontrati, e soprattutto le istituzioni che ci hanno lasciato. Si tratta di due uomini e di due poeti diversissimi. E però, e però scopriremo delle somiglianze e delle vicinanze interessanti. Sono uniti naturalmente dalla poesia e dall'amore per la natura e di questo ci parlerà il professor Pietro Gibellini. Ma D'Annunzio amava l'India e amava Tagore in uno dei, nel suo primo libro, un romanzo importantissimo uscito nel 1886, scusate, 89, Il piacere, il protagonista Andrea Sperelli 
eh, scrive il gran soffio di idealità che esalano i libri sacri indiani studiati e amati un tempo pareva lo sollevasse e tornava a risplendergli singolarmente la formula sanscrita cioè la gran parola che significa questa cosa vivente sei tu al vittoriale degli italiani l'annunzio eh, a cultore della bellezza ha raccolto molti oggetti di arte sacra e eh, di gusto orientale ma in particolare ce ne sono tre indiani particolarmente belli ma soprattutto abbiamo qui quattro volumi di Tagore. Eh, il primo, eh, ovvero l'offrande lyrique, eh, nella traduzione francese di André Gide, datato 1914, con angoli piegati e segni di lettura. E poi, man mano, tutti i libri eh, di Tagore usciti da Carabba, negli anni successivi, Il re della Camera Oscura, 1916, L'ufficio postale, 1917 e Uccelli migranti, 1918. Evidentemente, ripeto, letti e consultati. Eh, D'Annunzio si interessò anche ai, vi ai viaggi di Tagore in Italia, i due viaggi, lui non si muoveva più dopo che si stabilì al Vittoriale nel 1921. Curiosamente i due poeti sono anche eh, coevi, coetanei. L'annuncio è nato nel 1863 ed è morto nel 1938. E seguì i suoi viaggi, abbiamo molte riviste qui eh, negli archivi del Vittoriale che ne parlano. Mm, viaggerò io al suo posto e spero di venirvi a trovare presto in India ma um, chi era D'Annunzio? Perché troviamo delle somiglianze con Tagore? Eh, D'Annunzio eh, è stato uno dei personaggi che hanno più influito nella formazione di una coscienza laica aperta al piacere e attenta ai diritti e alle aspirazioni delle donne in Italia, come ha fatto Tagore in India. Eh, è vero, Tagore era antinazionalista, quanto D'Annunzio era nazionalista, ma di un, di un nazionalismo che si rifaceva più alla bellezza che è al passato, che alla alla potenza militare, all'espansione militare. Era come Tagore, un poeta che ha esordito giovanissimo a 16 anni con la raccolta Primovere e che poi ha avuto successo in tutti i settori dell'attività letteraria, la scrittura di romanzi, la drammaturgia, ma ha avuto anche successo come uomo pubblico come influenzatore di masse, eh, come dettatore di mode eh, e anche come seduttore di donne, che era un'attività che gli stava particolarmente a cuore. Poi la guerra, la prima guerra mondiale e qui c'è una separazione ovviamente eh, d'annunzio appunto da nazionalista pieno di amore patriottico che in Italia si concepiva come fine delle guerre di indipendenza. Infatti la prima guerra mondiale veniva chiamata quarta guerra di indipendenza. Si volle arruolare, combatté e compì e imprese eroiche, non sanguinarie, tese a sbeffeggiare il nemico austriaco e scopo raggiunto pienamente il volo su Vienna, la beffa di Bucari e altre imprese che lo resero celeberrimo in tutto il mondo. Poi, dopo la Prima Guerra Mondiale, l'impresa di fiume, ovvero quando conquistò una città 
che eh, non veniva assegnata all'Italia dai trattati di pace, benché fosse di cultura e di storia italiana, eh, lui si mise alla testa di un gruppo di soldati ribelli e senza sparare un colpo la occupò, la tenne per 16 mesi, benché la città fosse assediata dall'esercito italiano e la dotò di una Costituzione, la Carta del Carnaro, eh, fra le più moderne dell'epoca sicuramente, una Costituzione libertaria, democraticissima, eh, che può stare alla pari delle Costituzioni dei nostri tempi. A quel punto, finita l'impresa di fiume, l'annuncio era certamente l'italiano più famoso nel mondo, ma decise di ritirarsi al Vittoriale che chiamò poi degli italiani. La sua casa, che oggi eh, su un'estensione di 10 ettari e 3.000 metri quadrati coperti, contiene 33.000 volumi suoi preziosi, fra cui quelli di Tagore, 3 milioni di pezzi di archivio, 20.000 oggetti, di cui alcuni molto belli d'arte, e eh, che è anche la cassa museo più visitata forse al mondo con 300.000 visitatori l'anno e dove siete tutti quanti invitati, io spero presto. Che altro dire, ehm, le somiglianze fra i due poeti non finiscono qui, io ho degli appunti, potrei parlare della loro capacità di parlare alle masse, eh, della loro intensità nelle canzoni d'amore, di nostalgia, di apertura alla natura, al mistero della vita, al mistero della profondità dell'anima eh, e soprattutto alla loro polemica con, contro ogni tipo di limitazione dell'individuo. Io non saprei trovare somiglianza maggiore di questa eh, fra due grandi uomini che eh, speriamo di celebrare insieme quanto prima. Vi ringrazio e vi auguro buon lavoro. We can now break for uh, roughly 20 minutes for a tea which will be served uh, somewhere, either here or there, outside. So we can start again at 5 o'clock. Thank you. The second and last part of this seminar, we have uh, a paper by Professor Pietro Gibellini from Ca' Foscari University in Venice on the relations between Dante Alighieri and Gabriele D'Annunzio. Unfortunately, the professor cannot be here with us today, so we have uh, this uh, sort of um, different way of presenting his paper. The voice uh, and the presence will be of our friend Sujan Mukherjee here, whom I invite uh, to take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gianluca. Thank you, uh, the Victoria Memorial Hall, Professor Pryor, for organizing this. I'm just here to uh, read the paper on behalf of Professor Gibellini. Um, so I'll just get right to it. It's titled Dante Alighieri and Gabriel D'Annunzio. Gabriel D'Annunzio believed himself to be a worthy disciple of Dante Alighieri. Actually, he believed himself to be the only writer capable of surpassing the teacher. He wrote it in a note for the second unfinished volume of the secret book, which I found in the archives of the Vittoriale and published many years ago. All eyes refer to Professor Gibellini, not me. Um, where is poetry in Italian literature? This is D'Annunzio asking. In primitives, in certain notations in the margins of notary papers, but Ariosto, Tasso, all the rest, and Manzoni and Leopardi? Italian poetry begins with 200 lines of Dante and, after a long interval, continues in me. 
Modesty, as we know, was not one of D'Annunzio's qualities. He did, however, know by heart much more of Dante than the 200 verses which, in his grace, he praises as an example of the gift of poetry. If among the Latin poets mentioned by D'Annunzio, Ovid precedes Virgil and Orazio by some distance, the gap between the most cited of Italian poets, Alighieri, and the others is truly abysmal. If we are to look at his lyrical masterpiece, Alcioni, expressions taken from Commedia, at times with minor variations, amount to nearly 400. Sometimes they are homage mentions placed without quotations. Beatitudine, however, begins by citing a song from Vita Nuova, which goes, she has the color of pearl in form such as is fitting to a lady, not in excess. The evening personified is compared to La Beata Beatrice, Beatrice or the Blessed Beatrice, dear to the pre-Raphaelites and painted by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, whom D'Annunzio celebrated in a lyric in the Chimera. To underline its narrative structure that takes after Vita Nuovo, D'Annunzio called his collection an epic poem. But his protagonist is not the angelic Beatrice, nor the personified fierce solemn evening which leaves the spring with raindrops her tearful farewell, but the naked summer, wild, lustful, vertiginous. Like Dante's works, Alcioni tells of her appearance, her fullness, her death foretold by ominous clues. D'Annunzio reminds us in the incipit of the poem, that is to say in the first few lines, that the book takes a different direction from that of the still novist poetry as he resumes the chromatic syntagma of Vita Nova. A hawk screeches in the color of pearl, so that echoes uh, this idea of, uh, of the color of pearl from Vita Nova. Let's go back to the casts of the Commedia. D'Annunzio formed his poetic language through Dante's ink, even as Dante had found his in his mother's milk. But D'Annunzio would perfect it at the Cicognini boarding school in Prato. Cicognini? Cicognini boarding school in Prato, where he was mocked for his Abruzzi pronunciation, which sounded more Tuscan than the Tuscans. D'Annunzio leaves through the sacred poem sedimented in the boy's memory, even as the old man, as we see in his annotation-ridden copy of the 1907 Giovanni Andrea Scartazzini edition. The Dante that emerges in D'Annunzio's verses, if often lexicalized, is often lexicalized. Sometimes the master of recreation places the loaned phrase in the context analogous to the source. In The Shepherds, for example, the poet places two echoes from Purgatorio. O voice of whom for the first time knows the shimmering of the sea, motionless is the air. The exiled hearts feel the same nostalgia that characterizes the souls in purgatory. The desire to return to their soul's homeland, that are the mountains of Abruzzo for the former, and as for the latter, the house of the Lord. When the poet finds himself in the condition of a damned soul lying blindfolded after his aviation accident of 1916, he recalls the dazzling beginning of Dante's Nocturne. The room is silent of every light, he wrote, imitating the synesthesia of hell in Canto V. Quote, Into a place I came where light was silent all. Unquote. Similar in vocabulary and style to Dante, D'Annunzio too shows Dante's experimental thrust a hunger for life and thirst for reality. While in Dante, this is manifest in ways that, since Gianfranco Contini, are defined in terms of expressionism and plurilingualism, in D'Annunzio, they take a monolingual path, pouring a refined vocabulary into a loose syntax with short sentences. The work in which D'Annunzio engages most closely with Dante's poem is Francesca de Remini. An exemplary critical edition by Elena Maiolini was published by Vittoriale in 2021. The tragedy focuses on a character immortalized in Canto V of Inferno in the verse, We who stained the world with blood. The sonnet, I Fedeli d'Amore, taken from the Vita Nuova, serves as a prelude anticipating the fate of the two lovers. Although D'Annunzio added flavor by including his research on the medieval history of Romania, his main source remained Dante and Boccaccio. The character was known on the theater stage, especially through the tragedy of Silvio Pellico, 
but D'Annunzio created an original figure, deeply melancholic and with a perpetual feeling of being in an unspecified somewhere else. Like the rest of D'Annunzio's plays, the tragedy is better read than seen. In fact, the sumptuous scenography and the art of the divine Eleonora Duse did not meet with success. The text, however, remains a persuasive and touching read. Malatestino becomes the infernal character in the play, while the dreamer in love is freed from the morally dubious reputation she had long been attributed, and becomes the victim of a barbaric femicide. One of many that we find in the short stories of Boccaccio to Bandello, written at a time when the punishment for, the, for adulterers was brutal and merciless. While Francesca moves us, the protagonist of D'Annunzio's Fedra, written a few years later, leaves us feeling cold. A far cry from Racine's heroine, whose Christian blood our poet claimed to have replaced with pagan blood. The transfusion of ink, not of blood, remains an unsuccessful attempt to create a feminine Superman. Francesca was composed in 1901, the year before D'Annunzio inaugurated the Florentine Lectura Dantis which became successful, much to Pascoli's annoyance. Pascoli considered himself, I mean, his expertise on Dante to be superior to D'Annunzio's. He recited on that occasion his Laude a Dante, a long rhetorical poem later included in Lectra, a book that contains the praises of the heroes understood in Thomas Carlyle's terms as the champions of warlike courage, but also of thought, writing, music, and the figurative arts. D'Annunzio owned an 1888 French translation of Carlyle. The ode is not placed among the celebration of writers and artists, but at the beginning of the book, following the poem To the Mountains, which was inspired by Nietzsche's Zarathustra and preceding the praises of the patriots. Dante is celebrated there as a gigantic figure, a cliff standing in front of floating oceans of human destinies. As the father of the language and prophet of the glory of Italy, the chosen nation, to whom the closing poem, Canto Augurale, is dedicated. The poem addressed to Dante presents a studied numerological structure that evokes the epic. The 11 stanzas, it has 11 stanzas of 11 lines, three canticles of 33 kanti in triplets, and it is evident that by focusing solely on 11, the poet drops the Trinitarian implications of Dante's form. In his 121 verses, D'Annunzio celebrates Dante, but in exalting him, he deforms and mutilates him. Politically, his Dante is the son of a single homeland, that of the tricolor, but not of the three which Alighieri felt he belonged to in Florence. He belonged to Florence, Italy, and the Christian Empire. As for the moral inspiration of the masterpiece, Gabriel substantially reduces it to high revenge of the indignant Dante. Then there is no theological perspective. The vertical motion of descent to hell and ascent to heaven is replaced by the horizontal plane of the ocean agitated by the waves. To remove doubt, addressing the poet prophet, D'Annunzio alludes to your God twice. Ultimately, the poet of the third Italy inherits the risorgimento myth of Dante prophet of the lineage and combines it with Nietzsche's Ubermensch, the destroyer of accepted ideas also celebrated in Electra. In another ode in Electra, the Superman, placed beyond good and evil, is even the model for painting in verse the figure of Christ. The song of the death of the masterpiece, which is a part of this, uh, was written for the inexorable degradation of the Last Supper of Leonardo. His Jesus is not, God -made, is not a God-made man, but a great, deified man. Others are idols adored by D'Annunzio. The three that he replaces from Dante into beauty, homeland, and of course himself. In addition to the Laude, Dante features in most of the verses of Electra, especially in the ones on the death of Giuseppe Verdi, where his shadow, together with that of Vinci and Buonarroti, watch over the musician who wept and loved for all. His figure is like an underground river that ideologically connects the various heroes celebrated across the books. The turbid water of rhetoric flows, not the clear one of poetry, with some exceptions, such as the verses on Ravenna in the Cities of Silence. 
The Risorgimento myth serves as the basis of the luxurious edition of the Commedia, edited by Giuseppe Lando Passerini, with a preface by D'Annunzio, published by Olsky in 1911 for the 50th anniversary of Italy's unification. It was recast in the Favile del Maglio with the title Dante, the Printers and the Herdsman. The preface was written not as a scholar, but as a writer. The, bestia the bestiaio, or rude herdsman who read aloud Dante's Inferno, transcribed in crumpled notebooks of his ancestors, was favored over the erudite commentators. Even without glosses, pure sentiment enabled him to catch the true spirit of paradise, even without knowing the third canticle and without glosses. Quote, taking joy from the trill of the lark and from the third rhyme. Unquote. In this choice for hell and in the removal of paradise, we can hear the echo of the enduring position of Francesco de Sanctis, which exalted the first canticle and devalued the third, together with D'Annunzio's secular and aesthetic vision. For him, paradise is all in this life, in the beauty of nature and of art. In his rejection of the erudite glosses, D'Annunzio echoes Angelo Conti, who in his La Beata Riva, published in 1900, with a preface by D'Annunzio, held an anti-positivistic and, in a sense, a pre-Croatian position, snubbing documentary research. In the secret book, D'Annunzio pokes fun at Giovanni Andrea Scartazzini from Graubunden, distorting his name to Scarto, or Waste, Scartazzini. Yet, we like to think that the idea of the ferocious Pasquinata D'Annunzio wrote against Adolf Hitler was born from this content, contact with Dante's poem. Its first sketches appear on the pages of his copy of the Commedia mentioned above. In the Pasquinata, whose corrected text I had presented earlier dating, ba dating it back to 1933-34, the Gardon poet makes fun of the fanatic Führer, believing his threats ridiculous and remembering his past as a house painter. In short, he takes it lightly, which is hardly conceivable if it were written as was previously believed in 1938. It is somehow Dante-esque, the mockery of the tyrant that turns indignation into laughter through sarcasm. He is supposed to have written them during sudden flashes of inspiration that he had while sleeping. The commander had arrived at his Gardonesi residence in 1921, returning from the endeavor of Fume to which he associated the image of Dante, engraved by Adolfo di Carolis, to honor the poet's sixth centenary. He had asked his friends to add the words Dante's Acriacus, thus making Alighieri the icon of the unredeemed homeland. In the central hall of the Vittoriale, that the temple of Italianity, D'Annunzio placed a Dante-esque altar with De Carolis's engraving at the center. The opening lines of the poem, Three women around my heart have come, were used as a decoration in a room in his house, for Dante was, apart from being a poet of Italy, the exquisite poet of courtly love. Most of the notes collected in D'Annunzio's last major work, The Secret Book, 1935, date back to the 1930s. Dante is mentioned several times in that book, offering a symbol for discovering the most hidden essence of poetry. The phrase, the secret breath of poetry taken from purgatory, returns elsewhere in the book to designate that inexpressible element. The most interesting section, perhaps, is where he presents the great poet as his double, similar to him in his vicissitudes, passions and vices, bilious, libidinous, rabid, imperious, vindictive and cruel. Dante violent against nature, and finally Dante who casts his shadow in the pine forest of Ravenna and on the Adriatic shore, in the throes of death. In short, a father and double of the author, like Gabriel, he too a poet, soldier, a commander and a seducer. At this point, the exaltation becomes exaggerated. He says, while he, quote uh, uh, Dante, said of me, it is nice of you to have made me a part of yourself, of me, he said, all shame left, all your vision he makes manifest and leaves scratching where the man is, and this true epitaph of me engraved. The deformation of Dante's portrait initiated in the Electra Ode has continued. The face of Alighieri takes on the form and shape of D'Annunzio's. If earlier D'Annunzio felt he was Dante's worthy heir, 
Now Dante appears to him as the precursor, the prophet of great Danunzio himself. Thank you. Thank you, Sujan. Now we move to our next uh, uh, speaker and our next paper, Aishika, please. After which uh, we will have a video from Italy by Luisa Pryor. And then I will give again the floor to Sujan for the presentation of the book. Please. Thank you so much. Actually, dance is the language of the unlittered. The illiterate sometimes uh, speaks through heart or his body through dance. So what is the dance of the Renisha man, the universal man, the myriad-minded man, Rabindranath Tagore? Did he know how to dance as well? And then what was his idiom or idea was it classical, national, folk, tribal, or Eastern, Western, or something hybrid, an alternative third? Who danced to his tune, in what ways, and to what end, where, and when? Actually, when I was writing this paper, Dance Unbound, Nationalism, Transnationalism, and Dance Over from of Tigor, the invitation came from uh, Mario Prayer, and of course, from the Council General of uh, Italy in Kolkata. Incidentally and coincidentally, Dancers Guild, an institute I also belonged to as a dancer for quite uh, some years back, earned another uh, opportunity to dance Dante's, a portion of divine comedy, love, tragedy, and eternity, and it was supported by Kolkata's Center for Creativity. The lockdown and the pandemic once again gave me another opportunity to collaborate choreographically with my Alma Mater, once again, Dancers Guild, and we actually staged Dante's Divine Comedy through the language of Tagore, through a contemporary Indian dance language that traced its origin to the first Indian modern dance pioneered by Tagore. So I am thus happy twice over today. I thank once again the Italian consulate in Kolkata and Professor Mario Prayer for bridging the two uh, the, the worlds and in two ways for me, cerebrally as well as corporeally. Um, indeed, celebrating the impossible stretch of the genius of Rabindranath Tagore has never been an easy task. It's quite daunting. The man whose indefatigable creative oomph composed poems, songs, and fictions, weaving a wave of complexity around human emotions. The artist who, uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, the artist who took up his brush at the fag end of his career to draw up a surrealist canvas of colors, and also the accidental dance maker, choreographer, who at the twilight of his life, especially during the 1930s and 1940s, he set the stage and raised the curtain for the first Indian modern dance. So at a very significant moment of India's cultural past, of South Asian history, he set off a new politics of performance that inscribed new cultural meanings on the unmapped bodies of first modern dancers of India, who is actually without any inherited practices. When cultural revivalist, when the nation and its dancers presented before us a linear, monolithic, sacrosanct, pure, authentic dance language embedded in Natya Shastra, the Brahmanic cultural text and religion, Rabindranath envisaged a new discourse of performance at the interface of gender, nation, and performance. From page to stage, his avant-garde modern dance dramas thematically broke apart the iconic stereotypes of mothers and goddesses as he privileged the subversive, the transgressive, and the defined dancing bodies, reclaiming them from the margin, from the fringes, from the peripheries of the nation. So never quite loyal to the canonized classical, 
His unceasing experimentations with different physical traditions mark the very beginning of a structure defying freestyle from uncertain beginnings of Jorashako Natushala, of a private musical theater, Tagore's dance witnessed some discernible shifts, later evolving into a new transcultural style, absorbing, integrating, and expanding through various physical traditions. I have just used here some of his paintings, not actually the pictures or the, or the actual photographs from Shantiniketan or Jorashako. Here are some ideas painted by the poet himself that actually reflected the rhythm of the dancing body. When actually he took up the, took up the, uh, uh, the, the, the painter's brush also simultaneously, it was the actual, the, the last harvest of the Septuagenarian poet and who embarked on this twin uh, area, dance and also painting almost simultaneously. But while Jorashako introduced women from the educated middle class family, mostly the elite women, within the world space of their sprawling homes and uh, the, uh, the performance, Tagore school at Shantiniketan, more than 100 kilometers away from the city, drew in a wider section of performers from different parts of the country. It is not merely uh, Gauri Bhonjo or Nipedita, but Mrinalini Swaminathan or Saravai, Asha, Asha uh, Ojha and Visni Jagadia, Srimoti Tak. Tagore, who joined the, the Bishwabharati as students. And dance also emerged as a key curriculum in the holistic education of the pedagogic unit, nestling a world university. In that creative laboratory of Shantiniketan, Kothakuli met Jijutsu, invented or actually brought by Sinzo Tagakaki. Netaji Subhashchandra Bose played a very crucial role in inviting Sinzo Tagakaki during the time to Kolkata. And also had German expressionist style pioneered by Mary Wigman during this interwar period because Srimothi Tagore went to Dresden and learned the basic styles of Mary Wigman. And when on her return, she choreographed Tagore's Julon in a very different modern expressionist style. And also, Ruth Sandin is the American modern dancer, danced Tagore's Chitrangada, Chitra, in the Carnegie Hall of New York much, much before the actual Chitrangada was staged in Shantiniketan. So actually, this is the entwining the performative with his pedagogic mission. Tagore made dance a kinesthetic mode of community celebration in Shantiniketan as his festive carnivals like Boshun Tutshav, Meg Utshav, Botsho Boron Utshav, it, it actually presented dance before it reached out to a wider community of audience participants, even today, Vashantutshav is actually open to all. So the dance pedagogy he initiated at his choreographic curative laboratory disrupted fixed forms, fixed formulas, fixed identities. Born in a conjunction of culture, the new dance of Tagore endorsed quite a counter-hegemonic agency where movements were emanated from the soul, from the mind, from the gut. Here, classicism and modernism combine together to form something new. If we look at these pictures, nothing is just perf just Manipuri Lasho. Nothing is perfectly Kathakali uh, uh, Chari, but this is something else. This is a new language where the female body actually is moving into some emancipatory and a, a, a free mold. And the interwar interagnum, I'm coming back to 1920s and 1930s, was marked by Tagore's frequent visits and travels to Central Europe and United States, where at that time a new politics of modern dance, contemporary dance, swayed over the classical. The iconoclastic moves, just I'm talking about Ruth and Dennis, Mary Big Man, Laban, Juice, and they, in the meantime, they replaced the pink fairies and the of white swans and replace them with actual living presence of flesh and blood women. That informed Tagore's changing ideas of dance. In a fantastic allegory, uh, allegorical essay called Shonar Kati, written in uh, Bichitra Prabhundo, he welcomed the wild outlandish prince that is Western culture to wake up the sleeping princess, the oriental dance or culture from her deep slumber. 
She, he said, the age has come where all artificial fences are breaking down. In a conference of culture, only that will survive, which is basically consistent with the universal. In quest of that universalist language, he borrowed profusely, largely borrowed extravagantly from all parts of the world to blend classicism and modernism into a new artistic whole. He wrote in his ideas of art and aesthetics that art is not a gorgeous sepulcher, immovable, brooding over a lonely eternity of vanished years. It belongs to the procession of life, making constant adjustment with surprises, exploring unknown shrines of reality. So I actually like to end my uh, paper with, uh, uh, with the last concluding remark, and also I like to um, show a, a video clipping from Dante's, the, the work that we have just choreographed. But before that, uh, excuse me, just, just, just two seconds, yeah. So actually, um, I, one thing that actually when Mario was talking about um, Mussolini and Tagore's meeting, I'd like, just like to remind myself that on his return he choreographed, he actually written Noted Puja, the, uh, the worship of the dancing girl in 1926, that is his first dance drama, women-centric, where actually a dancing girl defied the power of a fascist king, the Hindu king, Ajata Shatru. Uh, so when nationalism stood for purity, singularity, Tagore's politics of performance unpacks hybridity as a pedagogic tool to establish diversity and plurality. It's marked by cultural openness along with this trust in diversity and tolerance. It is not about all, it's you and I, you versus I, but it's about, not about exclusion, essentialism, and difference. But unfortunately, the first modern dance, eclectic dance, envisaged by Tagore, found little appreciation in or within India. Because after all, once again, I started, dance is the language of the unlettered. And he also did not leave us with any single or simple formula to dance him out. He failed with all his sincere endeavors to make dance acceptable as a kinesthetic performing art that can engage a thinking body and a moving mind. But the time has come, we need to leap forward to break the fetus of orthodoxy, not to respect Tagore as a fossilized relic, unchanging and unchangeable, but to take him as a catalyst, an incitement as a dialogue between two ages. We should not attempt to encapsulate within finite boundaries an aesthetic that is free, dynamic, and living beyond, beyond hidebound strictures of tradition. The time has come to celebrate the quintessential truth of Tagore's aesthetics, which underscores faith in the individual and artistic freedom and universalism. So here is a, a presentation by Dancers Guild. Uh, the choreographers are also present here. So I, without wasting any time, I, I request to have a look at this. This is just a Thank 
These are the three uh, songs of Tagore we have used in this uh, s small part of Divine Comedy, Inferno. And unfortunately, we lost our music director to COVID in last year. And so, but 2021-22 is still very, very significant for allowing us this wonderful and unique opportunity. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me, and in particular, Victoria Memorial Hall, Italian Consulate General, Rubindra Parati University, and Università La Sapienza of Rome.
In this presentation today, I wish to highlight how the poetry of the Annunzian of Tagore influenced in a significant way the work of a generation of Italian musicians born in the last two decades of the 19th century. They initiated a process of profound reformation of the Italian musical language. At the time, Italy was still mainly the homeland of opera. However, the glorious story which had started in the 17th century was no longer seen by these composers as Italy's lucky fate, since this had discouraged and the development of orchestra and instrumental music and exchanges with a world that was experiencing an epochal cultural transformation. The connection of these musicians with high poetry, especially of these two poets, shows how they were striving for a new and original style, one that could project Italian music onto modernity. Since the birth of musical theatre, dated Florence 1600, to the beginning of 20th century, the great flourishing of Italian opera made Naples, Milan, Venice and the whole country become a musical centre of great importance. From Monteverdi to Pergolesi, from Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, Genesis of Belcanto, to Verdi and Puccini, Italian opera spreads all over Europe, imposing its model's taste and not last, its fanatical cult of the voice. Opposite to the Italians, we might say the Germans developed and dominated in the field of instrumental and orchestral music. Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Brahms, all settled in Wien, and later Wagner, created eternal masterpieces in Western music. In France, in the last decades of 19th century, with the revolutionary advent of poets of symbolism, a original new style comes to light and asserts its left as sign of new times in music. One of the first Italian composers responding to these new ideas was Alfredo Casella. Born in Turin in 1883, a child prodigy pianist, Casella was advised to study music in Paris by Giuseppe Martucci, one of the most famous, famous orchestra conductors of the time and a connoisseur of German and French symphonic repertoire. A 13 year old Casella arrived in Paris in 1896, where he could study piano and composition under the guidance of famous masters. In those years, the cosmopolitan city of Paris was on the rise as the new capital of European culture and music. The turn of the new century was in fact a crucial historical moment marked by significant experimentations in music. The French Claude Debussy, for instance, was the first to turn away from the traditional tonal composition style, while the Russian Igor Stravinsky was to take Paris by the storm with his Rite of Spring, famously premiered in 1913. At the same time, Casella passionately studied the greatest living composers from Vienna, like Gustav Mahler and Arnold Schoenberg, whose works, performances, Casella would promote in France and later in Italy. With the outbreak of the First World War, a mature 30-year-old Casella returned to Italy wishing to share his international experience in order to give a new impulse to music in his native country. Despite the strong opposition of the traditionalist and retro musical environments, Casella connected with important composers of both opera and instrumental music of the time, such as Ottorino Respighi, Ildebrando Pizzetti and Gianfrancesco Malipiero. He focused his action on two main directions. Firstly, bringing contemporary foreigner repertoires to Italy. Secondly, promoting instrumental music by new Italian composers in and outside of Italy. Settling down in Rome, Casella appeared in public with his latest compositions, strongly influenced by the most avant-gardist European trends. These works show an outstanding complexity. The synchrony of multiple patterns, like in Debussy and Stravinsky, generates complex harmonies. Polymodal, polytonal, rich of dissonances, in some cases closer to atonality, like in Schoenberg. Among the works that best represent this moment of his stylistic development, we find the four-song cycle, L'Adieu à la vie, Farewell to Life. 
composed in 1915. The text is taken from the French translation of Rabindranath Tagore's Gitanjali by André Gide in 1914, then soon after Tagore was awarded the Nobel Prize. Casella rearranged the four songs in a mournful series. These were the horrible years of First World War, and Casella found in Tagore his inspiration for a deep reflection upon the theme of death. At the same time, the choice of the Indian poet allowed him to make explicit his belonging to an avant-garde that looked up to European examples of Mahler, Schoenberg and Stravinsky. Mahler, in fact, was the author of the great orchestra song cycle, The Song of the Earth, which premiered in 1909. The lyrics were taken from an ancient Chinese poet recently published in German translation. Mahler chose Far Eastern poetry in his effort to project the suffering of mankind of a, on a timeless universal horizon. With him, Eastern poetry thus made its triumphal entry in Western music. Schoenberg, on his part, completed in 1912 Pierre Lunaire, a song cycle for voice and instruments that represented expressionism in music at its best. The new technique of Sprechgesang, spoken singing, prescribed by the composer is more a declamation, a hallucinatory colored intonation rather than vocal music in a traditional sense. Soon after, between 1914 and 15, Schoenberg sketched a symphony on text by Tagore, a work that he never ended. Thus, Tagore's inspiration traveled from Schoenberg to Casella and shortly afterwards to another Viennese, Zemlinsky, a follower of Mahler and a guide to Schoenberg. Zemlinsky premiered in 1918 his monumental lyric symphony based on Rabindranath's poetry. However, the avant-garde works of Schoenberg, Casella and Zemlinsky led to a final phase, that of expressionism, the long season of European decadentism, whose poetic inspiration was far removed from Tagore's. It was the sinister echoes of the First World War that made Tagore's poetry profoundly meaning to these musicians. Casella's work written during First World War were rejected by the Italian public. Despite his efforts to dialogue with the Italian milieu, Casella encountered a period of bitter conflict, especially with those who would later become the fanatical exponents of the most retrograde traditionalism, a side of fascism itself. After a period of silence, Casella returned in 1923 with a completely renewed style, which was no less a sincere expression of his search that had brought him and other companions to a new flourishing season of Italian classicism. However, despite this new style, he remained the target of the musical retrograde. After the outbreak of Second World War, when racial persecutions of Jews started taking place in Italy too, Casella and his Jewish wife, Yvonne, had to go into hiding. On the other hand, Casella found an authoritative partner for his act of musical renovation, reformation, in Gabriele D'Annunzio. Since 1917, D'Annunzio was the director of the music series Raccolta delle Nuove Musiche, New Music's Collection. Edited by Malipiero and others, Casella himself worked at the publications. Thanks to this project, the works of ancient masters like Pergolesi, Vivaldi and others were republished after centuries of oblivion. In 1923, Casale Malipiero proposed to D'Annunzio to lead a new association, whose goal would be to promote the performance of the master's music published into the raccolta, together with new compositions of Italian and foreign composers. Thus, under the auspice of D'Annunzio, the Corporazione delle Nuove Musiche was born. Together, they determined a glorious moment of Italian culture and musical history, which flourished until the Second World War. This action broke a kind of cultural isolation that had affected Italian music for decades and let Italians rediscover 
the ancient roots of their music. By all means, D'Annunzio can be recognized since his appearance on the cultural scene in the 1880s as the strongest modernizer of Italian culture. His action had great influence into the field of music as well. Let me take a quick glance at his years of apprenticeship. D'Annunzio's youth spent in his homeland Abruzzo amid a group of that met in the study of painter Michetti on the coast of the Adriatic Sea. A circle of artists, writers and musicians where the 16, 17 year old Gabriele could refine his sensibility to all forms of art and his personal innate sensitivity to color, image and sound, all the qualities which he developed in his writing. There he met, met composer Francesco Paolo Tosti, one of the best known authors of Romandas of all Europe and especially famous in Great Britain where he was appointed at the court of Queen Vittoria. Whilst publishing his first collection of poems, Primo Vere, with the publishing house Carabba, D'Annunzio started his long collaboration with Tosti. They were to sign together songs of great and profitable success. Interestingly, it was the same Carabba that would later be first to publish Tagore in Italy. Let's listen now to one of their romanzas. In less than one minute, they fully represent the image of their homeland sea, the Mare d'Abruzzo, connected with sensuality of love. Sea of Abruzzo, says the poet, how sweet is to love on your green shore, O blue sea, who in your strong amplex lives and dies. O love, he endlessly cries. Oh, love. D'Annunzio's engagement with Tosti definitely brought high poetry in the field of Italian song. Tosti was a connoisseur of the French and German art song, and together with D'Annunzio, he signed cycles of songs such as Le Canzoni di Amaranta, 1906, that can be considered to be among the first examples of Lyricas, the modern Italian art song. At the same time, other Italian musicians took poems by D'Annunzio and used them for their new style songs. Il De Brando Pizzetti, Ottorino Respighi, Riccardo Zandonai, and finally, the two, Malipiero and Casella, who in the year of the foundation of the Corporazione, 1923, composed lyricas based on poems of D'Annunzio collection Le Laudi. This was not only formal homage, rather it was the evidence of the artistic affinity that would let them successfully work together at the project of the Corporazione. Let's listen now to an example of modern lyrica on D'Annunzio's text. The most famous ever is I Pastori, The Shepherds, music by Ildebrando Pizzetti which is also one of the most beloved poems by D'Annunzio, where the poet sings his longing for the archaic life of his homeland and its landscape. He says, September is time to move. Now in the land of Abruzzi, my shepherds descend to the wild Adriatic Sea, that green is like the pastures of the mountains, which are also among the most famous verses of Italian poetry.
national and also nationalistic context, the success of a non-Italian, non-European poet as Tagore raises several questions. After 1914, up to the 1930s, art songs in modern and experimental styles based on Tagore's prose and poems were composed by many musicians of the European panorama as well as by a conspicuous number of Italians. Tagore had a wide diffusion in Italy thanks to the initiative of the publisher Carapa, who from 1914 to 1938 published about 20 different titles of all genres, from poetry to theatre to philosophy, speeches, letters, in fine book series at accessible prices. Thus we find readers of Tagore in some cultural musical circles in Florence, and Milan as well, circles that connected with D'Annunzio. D'Annunzio himself owned Gide's French translation of Gide and Jolly and some Carabas edition in his library, and was in contact with Tagore and Indian intellectuals. By the second decade of the 20th century, the most talented pupils of Pizzetti came to write music to Tagore's texts. They include Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco from Florence and Virgilio Mortari from Milan. Moreover, the talented Giorgio Federico Ghedini from Turin and the future pupil of Pizzetti, the child prodigy Nino Rota from Milan. Aged 11 to 13, Rota composed between 1921 and 1924 six songs under the suggestion of his elder cousin, the soprano Maria Rota, a singer discovered by D'Annunzio. Furthermore, both Mortari and Rota later became very close to Casella, who was a generous mentor and maestro to both. We can assume that the young composers were attracted to Tagore's lyrics, encouraged not only by his fame, but also by the consideration of authoritative personalities, such as D'Annunzio and Casella. Remarkably, Casella played for the last time Istagore's cycle of songs La Dieu à la Vie in a concert in Milano in 1926, which is the year of the second visit of Tagore in Italy. Different and last of my presentation is the case of Franco Alfano, belonging to the same generation of Pizzetti and Casella, born in Naples in 1875. He gained fame above all for two operatic enterprises, his opera The Legend of Sakuntala, whose libretto he wrote after the play of Kalidasa, the Sanskrit poet of the 5th century, premiered in 1921, a rare example of Italian opera set in India. In this, Alfano displayed a great orchestration ability, very close to the French taste and to the timbre palette of Debussy. And the major event of his life, the completion of Puccini's Chinese opera Turandot in 1925. Franco Alfano can be considered the most faithful to Tagore's poetry among European composers. From 1921 to 1948, a year before his death, he put in music 17 lyricas for voice and piano, in some cases put also in orchestral version. He was sincere in his love to Tagore, with whom he shared both love for humanity 
and what was perceived as Tagore's ascetic aspirations, both sacred and profane love. But his lifelong dedication took place in a kind of private, solitary and secret garden and was the far more authentic, perhaps. His music dresses the poet's words with fluid and iridescent timbres in the piano and a delicate singing which follows carefully the inflections of the poetic verse. He preferred texts where the poet put questions to himself or to an ambiguous entity, might be human or divine. A refined language, these lyrics would deserve to be performed more often. On the other hand, the Italian lyrica is composed for an Italian public in contrast with the very popular romanza of the 19th century. Does this Italian destination assign it to a sort of separate space where a number of little yet precious masterpieces can be found. I chose for you a last beautiful piece by Alfano Tagore, The Night and the Soul. Thank you for listening and best wishes and regards from Milano. A very uh, moving uh, presentation and um, and music in particular. So um, the final event of the day, uh, for which I have to thank um, Senor Gianluca Ribagotti, the Victoria Memorial Hall, Dr. Jayantushin Gupta, and Professor Mario Prayer for um, including within this kind of um, within the day's events the launch of uh, Alpona Ghosh's translation of Dante's Purgatorio, um, which, was, which, is, which is being brought out by Jadavpur University Press. Um, Jadavpur University Press began its journey about 10 years back, and one of the earliest kind of um, projects that it undertook was the Italian to Bengali translation series, which was edited by, I mean, the general editor of the series was Professor, is Professor Shukanta Choudhury. And um, Alpona Ghosh's life's work, in a sense, was um, translating the three-part uh, divine comedy into Bangla. Um, we are very honored to have with us today 
Srimati Damayanti Dash Gupta and Professor Choudhury. Um, may we please request both of you to join me here um, to sh share a few words about the translation, I mean the translation series and this project in particular and about uh, Alpona Ghosh. And um, could I also request Gianluca to please join us on stage to formally launch the book that is being brought out today. Thank you. I suppose, uh, since I've been outed by Shukantada, I might, might as well say a few words uh, as, uh, um, I mean, I'm part of a team from Jadavpi University Press. My colleagues are here. And we have been working very hard to actually have this book ready by today. Um, you know, um, in 2016, uh, um, Inferno in Bengali translation came out as Norok. And subsequently, um, um, Purgatario, which has been translated by Alpuna Ghosh, uh, Shuddhi Lok. Alpona Ghosh passed away last year, but uh, she has, in fact, finished all three um, uh, parts of Divine Comedy. So, Shargolok, the next part will probably, um, we'll, we will work on it. It will take time. And uh, this took us six years. But we are very happy that we have been able to uh, uh, finish this uh, project in time for this uh, very special event. I should uh, also thank Shujan, uh, because he's done the cover, as you will see, of uh, this, this particular book. Um, Alpona, uh, Alpona Ghosh's daughter, Dhamunti Dashgupta, who's also a translator in her own right, is here. And I would first uh, like, uh, like to request Dhamunti to say a few words about um, Alpona Di and her work. Good afternoon. I feel myself honored to address such eminent persons present here. It is of great pleasure to me observing the launch of Shuddhi Lok, Bangla translation of Purgatorio, the second part of Dante Allegri's La Divina Commedia. Though I am not at all a suitable person to discuss about the translation itself, I am grateful to its publisher, Jadapur University Press, for giving me opportunity to speak a few words about the translator, my mother, Alpuna Ghosh. She would have been so happy to tell you in her own words about her journey through life with Dante. An epitome of passion with an undying willingness to follow it, with absolute dedication, would perhaps be an appropriate phrase to describe my mother, Alpuna Ghosh. She was attracted by the life and works of Dante while in her college days. Unfortunately, life had a string of obstacles planned for Alpuna and did not give her an iota of a chance to carry out her devotion towards Dante till she became a senior citizen. My mother used to jokingly tell us often that even if she were buried under concrete, she would sprout reaping through it. That she did indeed. From a middle class homemaker and a good mother, she became a prominent author by her determination and dedication. She wrote a number of novels and short stories, which had been published by renowned Bengali publications. But through these years, she always wanted to pursue her love of Dante's work. In the first decade of this century, when Alpuna was already in her 60s, she learned Italian to follow her love and thus embark on a new journey, a journey through the great works of Dante Alighieri. High diabetes and a major surgery at this age could not deter her from this path. By the time she left us, almost one year back, she had completed translating La Divina Commedia in Bangla. This has been the first translation of La Divina Commedia in Bangla prose directly from the original Italian verse. Bangla translation of the first part of La Divina Commedia, Inferno, that is Norok was published earlier by the Jadapur University Press, and now the second part, Purgatorio, that is Shuddhilok, is in our hands too. 
I am very much proud to tell you that she completed the final part two, Paradiso, that is Sargolok. Her own journey of life came to an end with it. As a person, Alpana Ghosh has been an inspiration to many and will remain that way for a much longer duration. I will not take much more of your time. I convey my sincerest gratitude to the respected Professor Emeritus, Mr. Shukanto Choudhury, for being the editor of this Bangla translation of La Divina Comedia. As a professor, Mr. Obhijit Gupto, director of Jadapur University Press, all I can say is, all this could not have happened unless there were you. Thank you so much. After suffering for long in the hills, let us now be purified through the purgatory, and then we will proceed towards the paradise. Thank you all. Namaskar. Thank you, thank you, uh, um, May I uh, ask Professor Shukanto Chaudhary to say a few words about his experience of uh, editing and uh, the two volumes of uh, uh, Inferno and Purgatorio in Bing Bengali translation. I think I should begin by just expressing the deep sorrow, which in my case is so accompanied by a sense of guilt as well, that uh, uh, Alpunadi did see the publication of the first part of the trilogy, Norok, Inferno, but uh, she passed away even before the second part appeared, and now, of course, she will not be there to see the launching of the third, but we will ensure that it is completed. It, it takes time. Uh, in, to work it in with various other activities, but uh, that is an explanation, not an excuse. See, the Jadapur University Press has this uh, publication series of translations from Italian into Bengali, Italio Bangla, uh, Onubad Mala. Uh, the, the condition for incorporation and for inclusion in the series is that the work must be translated directly out of the Italian language and not through English uh, or uh, any other intermediate source, etc. Uh, this, of course, reduces the number of possible translators, um, and there are still a certain number who are available from whom we have so far not been able to extract translations, been despite our persuasions and indeed their promises, but without various things get in their way too. So we published two volumes, beginning with uh, a translation of. Machiavelli's Il Principe, you know, The Prince, by our colleague, Dr. Doita Mojumda. Doita was here. Is, is Doita still no. here? No, she's left. She was here early in the evening, left now, I think. And then I brought out a small selection from the writings of Leonardo da Vinci. And we were just wondering what we could have to follow when suddenly one day Obhijit came to me and said, Shukantata, uh, a remarkable thing has happened. I've got a parcel through the post saying, I have a complete translation, a Bengali translation of the, the, the La Vida Comedia to offer you. Would you like to take a look at it? You know, it's like a sort of science fiction story. But anyway, the translation did arrive. And of course, as soon as we had gone through, uh, even after the first, uh, the first reading of it, it was very obvious that this was something we just had to publish. Unfortunately, it took time because you know there was a lot of editing to be done, and also, of course, there was the complete commentary. Alpanati had provided a certain amount of commentary, but uh, given the intensely elusive nature of uh, Dante's poetry, to the history and politics of his time and of uh, earlier times, to the, the intricate theology, and uh, so many other things. Um, just uh, you know, working all that into the translation and uh, providing the full elaborate annotation, building on what Alpunadi had already provided, all this took time. There was a question of an introduction. You see, the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the Divine Comedy calls for a huge ap apparatus. And there were also illustrations, diagrams to explain Dante's universe. And by the time we had put all this together, 
well, for, even for the first volume, it took some time. For the second volume, it took too much time. And now I think we can only sort of promise to the memory of Alpunati that we will ensure that her work uh, lives to see the light of day in completion, even though she is no longer here. Let's see how soon we can manage it. It will take some time, I'm afraid, as there's no point in saying that it will be out next year because it will take more time than that. But we shall do our best. Okay. Thank you. That's the final act uh, of, this of this session. I May I request uh, Professor Chaudhary Daimantidi and, in fact, uh, Senior Ribagutti, Professor Shengupta and Professor Pratt to uh, open these five <laughs> Um, uh, uh, volumes very nicely packaged by our colleague Rishum. Uh, if you would just launch it. Uh. <laughs> no, you can also <laughs> launch it. <laughs> but uh, I take the opportunity of being on the stage to thank everybody and to, uh, I think we have like 10, 15 minutes for Q&A if somebody has, would like to ask something to our professor, there is a cordless mic which I would request uh, somebody to take around. I'm sure since uh, here we are among uh, scholars and professors, I will not receive uh, any questions on visas. And uh, let's see what. <laughs> mm. It would be the first time eh? I will not receive any question on visas. But. I'm just here, of course, to collect the questions, and then I will ask uh, the concerned person to, to give a proper... Uh, we have somebody there? Please. If you can please uh, introduce yourself uh, and briefly a question, possibly not a statement or a uh, comment. Or is it on? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello. Is it on? Oh, myself, Devashish Paul. I'm a guest lecturer of film series. I just wanted to ask uh, that uh, the entire seminar proved a very grand success. It proved all hearing all the speakers. And just to tell you one is a small proposal. We Calcutans or Kolkata, uh, people of Kolkata do not know anything about Dio and Inzio much, which I'm saying. So if a separate seminar could be arranged in near future, focusing on the uh, life and works of Dio and Inzio, Maybe some months later, it would be much better for if benefited for all the Calcutans. I mean, the literary lovers of Calcutta. That's it. Sure. Thank you very much okay. for Thanks. your non-question but suggestions, no which I embrace because, as you may have heard from one of the videos, the president of the foundation of Gabriele D'Annunzio in Italy has been officially invited by the uh, Takurbari Museum to come uh, to hopefully sign an MOU or a twinning between the two house museums, which will be, we hope, a source of literary collaborations between the two centers. And of course, when we have uh, uh, Professor Giordano Bruno Guerri here, we will make sure that he will uh, uh, explain to the people in Kolkata about uh, the figure, the works, uh, and the life of Gabriele D'Annunzio. You just have to be patient a few months, I hope. We have somebody else here. Uh, my question, my, my name is Rudrajit Dashtakur. 
I'm a student of Bengali literature in University of Calcutta, Masters. So my question is, uh, in uh, the essay, uh, Bia, uh, Dante, Beatrice, and, uh, and even Tahar Kabbo, Rubinath write that Beatrice, uh, Gante, Jivan Devota. So we all know that Kadambari Devi is kind of someone in Rubinath's poem. So my question is, and so similarly, Beate, Dante meet Beatrice when she was nine, and Kadambari Devi was nine, and Rubinath was seven when they meet. So is there any similarity established by their relationships that between Dante and Rabindranath throughout Beatrice and Kadambari Devi? Thank you. Sorry, we are going into matrimonials probably. I don't know if Professor wants to say something because... Uh, please come. Let me make a brief reply. Yes. Um, actually, I think there can be no comparison. There, I mean, in the case of Rabindranath, I don't know whether the age coincides, but I wasn't aware of it, you may be right, but whether the, there was any meaningful relationship at all between the, the, the Rabindranath and Kadampuri is a matter of doubt. Some say yes, some say no. And in any case, it is, surely it can be no more than an episode in Rabindranath's life. The very few critics or commentators who would say that Kadamburi underlies the figure of Jibon Devota running through Rabindranath's writings. There are very few of them indeed, and the idea has not found general acceptance, probably with good reason. Whereas in the case of Beatrice, there is absolutely no doubt that Beatrice was Dante's sort of kind of general muse, inspiration, and a kind of spiritual influence and guide who appears practically all through his writings from beginning to end. Okay, named, put forward. I mean, these are, so between one very marginal and very largely speculative um, factor in the enormously rich, varied, complex career of Rabindranath, and the undoubtedly central and dominant role played by Beatrice in Dante's uh, imaginative life. There can be no comparison, I think. They're poles apart. Okay. Um, I have a question also. Uh, I'm Sanjukta, uh, Sanjukta Das Gupta uh, from Sapienza University. I am afraid I have not read Dante, and uh, I'm asking out of sheer ignorance. And uh, what I would like to know is. Um, Beatrice, uh, uh, I mean, I've read uh, also, uh, you know, the, it's been disputed whether uh, Beatrice was a historical figure or really a muse, which, uh, you know, kind of uh, goes beyond uh, being a real actual figure, but uh, uh, much more imaginative. So I would like to know a little more about that. Oh, well, I, can answer, I can answer in one sentence. Undoubtedly, she was a historical figure. There was such a person, Beatrice Portinari. She was the daughter of... Uh, you know, one of the leading uh, families, uh, one of the leading citizens of uh, Florence. So undoubtedly she was a real-life historical figure, no doubt of that. Okay. What Dante then proceeded to make of her in his imagination after her death, that of course is another matter. I think we are done. So thank you very much to all of you for being here throughout this long and dense uh, uh, seminar. Enjoy your weekend and see you soon. Thank you.